Hey there students, thanks for taking a look at this video. This is a session which is focused on A-level physical education and the social-cultural aspect of those course. Now, whether you're an AQA, an OCR, an Excel, or a WJC student, these resources are relevant to you. We've made sure that they're relevant to all of you, okay? So have a good look. If there's anything that's not relevant, we'll spell it out to you, okay? So you can be absolutely confident this is useful for you. The notes pages which you need to follow along are just below in the description. So go and get hold of those, print those off, and follow along. If you don't want to take a big knee three hour chunk of teaching, which many of you won't, I'm not sure I would either, then take a look at the links below, which allow you to jump from topic to topic and will give you the key sort of transition points between the things that I'm going to teach to you. Get ready for the exam answer demonstrations when I look at all those explaining, evaluating, analyzing, type skills, and extended writing also. Again, have a look in the description to see, the, to print off the examples of the questions that we're going to be covering. Let's go. So we are addressing ethics. And of course, when we talk about ethics, it's kind of normal that we talk also about deviance. So we're going to come to that point in a few moments time, in the second half of this kind of chunk. Um, but before then, I really want to get into a conversation about the notion of sportsmanship and gamesmanship. Before that, I want to remind you of an idea. And it's an idea of amateurism. And often when people hear the term amateurism, they think of you know, in sporting context, someone who does sport but doesn't get doesn't get paid. But I kind of want you to ch switch your frequency to something slightly different about this notion. Amateurism is much more of what we call a traditional nineteenth century code. What, James? It's not just about not getting paid. No, it's a it's a traditional identity born out of the sporting ethics of the of the developing middle class in the early to mid nineteenth century that is represented strongly through a notion of sport. So a little bit more detail uh, on that is that it's very important to follow rules. We're going to talk about that in a few moments' time. Now, I don't think anyone would disagree with that point, but where does that lead us to in, in sort of a modern sporting context? It comes out of a notion of codification and codified sport, sport with set rules, laws, and regulations, codified often by people from that middle-class group, so it reflects the identity of that group. It's also what we call structural fairness, structural Structural fairness, really nice term to get into your answers if you can. Structural fairness, and what we mean by that is sometimes we call that, um, sometimes we call that the contract compete. Sometimes we call that notion of fair play that everybody has the right to perform on a level playing field. Everybody has a right to equal access and opportunity because the codified and structured nature of the sport and the activity ensures that. It is also what we describe as sport with moral values. Now, we're going to talk about this a lot, moral values. So sport with moral values, and we want to understand that notion. That sport is just not something you do because you're trying to win or compete, but you're doing it for a moral underpinning structure. As I said before, it's a very middle class concept. Okay, so it's a very middle class concept. I'm not saying that's bad or that's good. That's just the reality of this tradition. And we also want to argue here that the amateur view is that the main emphasis, at least theoretically, is on taking part and not necessarily on winning. Finally, my final point, point is that amateurism is based on a notion of, put this in inverted commas, God given abilities. Okay, so something like a very scientific approach to sport, God-given abilities. A very scientific approach to sports, to coaching, to biomechanics, to medicine, would be quite outside of this amateur, amateur approach. It would be a much more scientific, professional, modern approach. So it's important to understand that notion of amateurism because it feeds into this notion of sportsmanship and gamesmanship. Now, today, how are we going to see this represented? Well, we see it represented today in things like fair play awards, Okay, you know, um, sometimes they're valued and sometimes they're not. We see it represented today in sort of um, in the process of professionalization. Now, you might think, well, that's the opposite of professionalization. But if you look, for example, at rugby uh, in the 90s, rugby in the 90s was an amateur code and it is now developed into something which is different to this. It is a scientific professional approach to developing best quality performance 
possible. So we have this as an indicator that this amateurism has been in evidence. So in that context, we now want to understand the distinctions and differences between a notion of sportsmanship or sportspersonship and a notion of gamesmanship or gamespersonship. From now on, I'm going to use the term sportsmanship and gamesmanship um, for sportspersonship and, and sportsmanship. Okay, so sportsmanship, first of all, key points we are talking here about an activity or a sport which is played playing um, by the written rules okay so sportsmanship is depicted by playing by the written codified rules we know that but we also depict sportsmanship as with a code of fairness with a code of fairness a code of fairness and that's a nice distinction to make because of course you know when we talk about gamesmanship we're going to perhaps be losing that notion we're also talking about a notion of sportsmanship as maintaining fairness maintaining fairness now that fairness could be that everyone has an equal opportunity and access that fairness could be that everyone's treated the same that fairness could be that the rules create a level playing field something along the lines of weight classes for example age divisions these ensure that by structural fairness we have fairness coming through in the experience of participating in sport sportsmanship often has at the heart etiquette okay interesting word to spell uh, three t's in there there's number one there's number two there's number three etiquette and what we mean by etiquette is this notion of code of ethics, the, unlit, the unwritten rules, the conventions that a sport incorporates, uh, cheering the opposition, congratulating an opponent player when uh, you lose and they win. E um, uh, etiquette could be um, uh, things such as encouraging uh, supportive comments, uh, encouraging supportive commentary. Etiquette could be, for example, um, when you're uh, when when you I don't know when you're playing rugby or football and uh, the ball's gone out of play, you offer your hand to pull your opponent from the ground. For example, these would be good examples of etiquette-based behaviour. But we also want to say about sportspersonship, sportsmanship, that this is declining. It's declining in the modern era. And you may want to quickly have a scan down at the question we're going to have a look at, at the moment in a moment about why that decline might have happened. And is that because winning is becoming the most important thing? Is that to do with commercialization? Is that to do with a profit driven motive? Okay, are those things declining this traditional approach? And we can kind of understand that better if we look at a notion of gamesmanship. Now, one of the descriptions I really like with gamesmanship, let, have a look at this, and winning by cunning, cunning means. Winning by cunning means. So finding a loophole, finding a hack, finding a way to use the rules to your advantage. Now, importantly, gamesmanship is within the rules so we're not talking about cheating we're not talking about breaking the rules it's within the rules but we describe it as stretching or bending the rules okay uh, we could also talk about uh, let's get, let's give some examples of this we would have things such as uh, delaying okay so that would be a good example we would have things such as time wasting now you've got to check within the particular game whether this is you know often this is outlawed but people kind of get away with it um, we would be talking about things such as sledging you know using kind of uh, clever or well, sometimes clever sometimes not clever comments to the opposition to kind of put them off this could involve things like psyching out you know a bit of a staring match might be a good example uh, we might be talking about sort of clever use of things like injury timeouts you know um, uh, getting your team arrest by needing treatment on court, for example, or on the pitch, th things like that would be interesting. Uh, we've even got things such as in the modern era, things like you uh, um, inappropriately using things like toilet breaks in tennis, say, where a player will um, uh, wander off for a bit because they need to sort of change focus or they need to do something. They'll use that notion of toilet break. And um, 
these would be some really really nice examples of gamesmanship okay so we've got a we've got sportsmanship and gamesmanship and the thing you need to realize there is that they are not completely different there is probably a moral and ethical difference between the two but they are similar they are both within the rules for example but gamesmanship has become more common why we've got this notion of increased commercialization so the greater value of winning we've got winning or the win ethic becoming the win at all costs ethic let me write that up there have we moved towards a win at all costs ethic which by the way can take us well beyond gamesmanship which we'll look at in a second and where I'd like to take us next with this is I'd like to look at the notion of deviancy. Now, let me be clear. Deviancy is absolutely not cheating. Uh, sorry, is absent. <laughs> sorry. Uh, deviancy is absolutely not gamesmanship. OK, so let me define deviance for, deviancy for you. First of all, we are talking about deviancy, which is something which is differing from the norms of society. Okay, so something which is differing from the norms of society. That's our definition of deviancy. And I bring your attention to these terms in particular that are going to be important when you describe that thing. Now, I also want to introduce you to a notion, well, really three types of deviancy. I'll come to the third one in a moment. The first one is what we call negative deviancy. And often with deviancy, this is the one we tend to look at. So let me give you some examples of what we mean by this. By the way, this is what we call a Bell distribution curve. And Bell distribution is... A very interesting concept because some of you will have studied it, I'm sure. Um, Bell distribution is very interesting because it can often uh, detail and display or, or illustrate the overall behaviors of a large population of people. And it often comes, we often find that behavioral tendencies in populations end up in this bell curve distribution. Okay. And you see why it's a bell curve because it's because it looks like a bell. And what we're describing with a negative deviancy, we are talking about notions. Let me just do something a bit lighter than that. We are talking about notions such as negative deviancy over on the left. We are talking about notions such as performance enhancing drugs. We are talking about notions such as violence in sport, you know, things that really are ethically condemnable. We are talking about cheating. Those of you on the pulse can think about Australian cricketers tampering with uh, cricket balls, for example, if you like. We could also be talking about things like betting scandals, you know, um, whether that's you know a, a sports person betting on or against themselves, or it could be providing information to others. Uh, for betting and we've also got notions of match fixing now notice on our distribution curve that relatively few people undertake that those behaviors in comparison to the norms norms will be things like trying hard uh, playing within the rules uh, attending training doing warm-ups that kind of stuff so we're going to get relatively few in comparison to that number but we've still got a group of people who would be willing to do this now the other thing i'd say is the more negative things get we're down to this kind of area here you know like real nasty substance abuse things like think lance armstrong is a good case for that you know we're talking about right down here quite rare and in his case very very high profile but we also need to understand what this group are doing over here you know this is what we call positive deviancy well that's a good thing isn't it if people are doing things positively well with positive we've got a different notion with positive we are talking about notions of over applying the norms of society such as working hard so what does that lead to it leads to things like overtraining. Okay, overtraining is a positive deviancy characteristic. We could also lead to things such as overconformity. Okay, overconformity would would be like accepting uh, the view of dominant people in the group. So overconformity would just be going along with the crowd. For example, for example, uh, the culture of cycling is is rampant drug use. So you conform to that set of behaviours, which of course would lead you down into the negative deviancy uh, setting as well. We're also talking about positive deviancy, but such as being personal sacrifice. You know, for example, becoming so dedicated to your sport that you lose your family, that your husband, your wife leave you never see your children anymore this sort of thing would be personal sacrifice again get it clear in your own mind how you see that 
And then, of course, what we've got here is we've got the notion of overuse injuries. And, of course, that comes from overtraining or <clears throat> can also come from a lack of variety in training, of course, or poor technique. But in this case, it's coming from overtraining. Overuse injuries such as stress fractures would be classic examples of what we call positive deviancy. And both of those are to be, of course, avoided. And coaches and trainers need to work with people to ensure that they don't go down that role of deviancy. That, that route of deviancy. Now, let us do some questions. Now, I've taken these questions bit by bit. I'm only going to demonstrate questions in this first half of the session. When we do the second half of the session later on, I'm actually going to get you guys in, in the entirety to the question. I'm just going to give you a structure. I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys write. Now, on this one, however, we've got a question. Notice here, as I said before, this is not necessary for OCR. So using examples, explain why. Okay, so explain why. So explain why leads me to because... Explain why it leads, leads me to language such as therefore, comma. It could lead me to this means. Okay, that sort of language is explaining why. Explain why gamesmanship has become a common feature of contemporary sport. For anyone who's unsure, contemporary means kind of like modern. Okay, so let's have a look at this. First of all, note what I do in the outset. Gamesmanship is the stretching of the rules to gain an advantage. Now, we're going to get a mark here, I think, the stretching of the rules. What am I doing with green? We're going to get a mark here, I think. But notice I'm not explaining yet, but I'm going to get a mark. What have I done there? I've taken my term and I've defined it. Okay, define my terms. Now, okay, the question isn't specifically asked me that, but I've got six marks and it's not told me what gamesmanship is, so I'm going to tell it what gamesmanship is. So I get my mark in there because I'm clarifying the terms. Second bit, this is more common because I don't need an introduction. I don't need to go onto some beautiful structure of, of, you know, like working my way to the answer. No, I'm answering. This is more common because, okay, there's my language from over there. I'm explaining why. Why is it because? Why is it because? This is more common because, and here's my some of my answer, because of the growth of the win at all costs ethic. So growth of win at all costs, the increased importance of winning, and the growth in commercialism. Nice marks. I've given some reasons why. This is explaining why it's become um, more games. Uh, it's become more common. Let's keep going. Therefore, comma. Don't forget that little bad boy in there. Therefore, comma. The traditional ethos of sportsmanship has been diluted. I'm really happy with my word diluted here because so, sportsmanship has not been lost. It's just not as clear anymore. It's just not as common. It's just not as consistent. So it's been diluted today. Now, you could choose whatever word you used, but I'm trying to get that idea across. So traditional idea, traditional ethos of sportsmanship has been diluted. Next point. Instead, comma, we have a professional approach. Okay, so I might get my mark there, where the rules are to be taken advantage of. And the only commodities of value, I've got my max, I believe, the only commodities of value are profit and winning. And I've got some extra detail there, should I have need that, needed them. Go back to the question, did I explain why gamesmanship has become a common feature today? Yes, I said these are the factors and I've said why sportsmanship has been lost. Now, I perhaps could have got a mark for defining sportsmanship as well, but let's move on. Again, with reference to the sport of tennis, compare compare now com compare questions must be met with comparative statements compare gamesmanship and deviancy so let's go through this slowly okay compare gamesmanship and deviancy so let's go first of all gamesmanship is within the rules comma space whereas deviancy is against the rules look within the rules against the rules now would i get one mark or two for that comparison we never you, you can never be sure in this situation let's be super harsh on ourselves and give ourselves just one for that comparative statement perhaps we get two for that now then here's my question to you what is the weakness with that comparative statement have a look at it there's something wrong with it in relation to the question what is it and it's this guy here tom i haven't made reference to tennis if you're asked to give examples you must give examples, okay? I don't know if you'd need to give it in every single comparison, but you should get it in there. Gamesmanship is morally dubious, okay? So I've got morally dubious for gamesmanship. Similarly, deviancy is immoral, such as a tennis player taking steroids. Ah, now I've got my example in there, 
Okay, let's keep going. Making comparative statements. Look in this one. By the way, comparisons, you do get similarities and differences. That's important. So look, similarly, comma, so we've got morally dubious. Similarly, DVC is immoral. So that's a similarity. Not the same, but similar. Gamesmanship is just within the norms of society. However, comma, deviancy, such as verbally abusing your tennis opponent, is outside the norms. I keep going. I'm being harsh on myself here. Gamesmanship is the win ethic. So gamesmanship is like a win ethic, you know, professional approach, doing what you need to do. Comma space, whereas deviancy is the win at all costs ethic. Four marks. Let's keep going. No tennis uh, example there, of course. Gamesmanship leads to assertion and sometimes aggression. Okay, so we might get this sort of assertive, aggressive behavior. However, comma, deviancy leads to violence and drug use, cheating, things like that. Now, I didn't get my max. Okay, I've been super harsh. I didn't get my max. Now, I think in the actual exam, I'm probably going to get way more. Potentially, I've got way more than six points there. But can you see my point about comparative statements? If you've been asked to compare, you must compare. And if you're not using language such as comma, space, whereas, however, comma, similarly, comma, at the start of a sentence, what else have I got? Um, what else did I use in here? I've got those are the ones I used. If I'm not using that um, similarly, comma, if I'm not using however, comma, if I'm not using comma, space, whereas, I'm probably not comparing and I must compare. Okay, specifically deviance or deviancy. By the way, you can use either the term deviance or the term deviancy. They are synonymous terms. So we want to look specifically at performance enhancing drugs. Okay, so I've made a note here for us to have a little look at types of performance enhancing drugs. So I want to kind of jump to some big categories. Don't consider this list to be in any way exhaustive, okay? I'm going to be touching on some of these as we go through. First of all, I want to consider what we call peptide hormones. Now, it seems like a fairly grand term, but I want to introduce you to two factors or two areas of this. The first one is EPO. EPO or erythropoietin and human growth hormone HGH. Now, human growth hormone in many ways kind of does what it says on the tin, and I'm not going to go too far down that rabbit hole. If you want to have a look at work on HGH, go and have a look at our, our, the everlearner.com and look at our full playlist on that. On EPO, I think this one deserves a little more attention in this particular case because it is a particularly powerful substance for aerobic athletes and for particularly the development of red blood cells. Now, if you consider that the growth of red blood cell, the process called erythropoiesis, and we're talking about here erythropoietin, this is a hormone which we all produce naturally, which stimulates the production of red blood cells, okay? So you can start to realize how that would be so effective for something like an endurance athlete. Think Lance Armstrong, think uh, uh, road cyclists, think about those sorts of performers are very likely to have a temptation to use something like EPO. I also want to talk to you uh, briefly about anabolic steroids. Okay, anabolic steroids. Anabolic steroids are probably the, the granddaddy of performance enhancing drugs, widely used uh, it by North American teams and Eastern European teams through the 70s, 80s and 90s and have persisted in their use. So <clears throat> a couple of things about anabolic steroids. We are particularly talking about lean muscle growth. Okay, lean muscle growth. And we are particularly talking about this in the context of this being a training drug. Okay, now EPO in many ways is a performance drug, whereas tra uh, anabolic steroids are a training drug. They allow the intensity uh, of training to be higher and the recovery times to be shorter, this training drug of anabolic steroids. And they're based on the basic principles of testosterone. Okay, and testosterone, coming back to this point, produces lean muscle growth. So, of course, we have countless examples of athletes who have been found guilty of uh, use of anabolic steroids. A, a particularly uh, modern one would be someone like Justin Gatlin, for example. But you can, you know, you can have a little look, and there's there've been literally hundreds. Um, other drugs that I think it's useful just for us to have a grasp of. I want to talk to you about diuretics. Uh, diuretics um, are a flushing drug. A flushing drug and they cause urination now you might think hang on why is that useful so what we mean by this is that if someone for example has been taking nandrolone say um, 
and they use a, a diuretic, it's going to help to flush the evidence of that anabolic steroid out of the system. The other thing is that urination can help people lose fluid quickly and therefore they can make weight in MMA or horse racing or something like that. And finally, I wanted to mention the, the use of stimulants. Okay, stimulants, and I'm going to give you one example of stimulants, and it, I'm, I'm picking this one particularly because it's not illegal, and an example would be something like caffeine. Okay, caffeine, which used to be legal above a certain level, is now completely accepted as a, as a performance enhancing, how would you call it, supplement is the word I'm looking for, and caffeine, for example, it up arrow increases alertness, so it's really nice for, you know, games players, for example, and it increases fat metabolism. So it gets fat to the muscle faster and more efficiently. So these kinds of performance enhancing drugs are really important. But the one I kind of want to leave you with is this one. And it's the notion of blood doping. Now, I'm not going to get into gene doping. Uh, I'm not going to get into narcotic analgesics. I'm not going to get into a couple of other areas as well. Do your research on those, please. It's, it's worthwhile. But blood doping and particularly the use of transfusions has uh, is, is become particularly common until recently. And the main reason for that was that they found a way of testing EPO. So EPO, by the way, is often considered a form of blood doping. But transfusions where we take, or we, we, as if I've ever done it, but where an athlete would remove uh, up to, by the way, it can be a massive amount of blood, sometimes between one and two liters is common i think that through for a second they would remove that much blood and what they would then do is they'd spin it in a centrifuge centrifuge is like a spinning machine and what happens in that centrifuge is all the heavy elements of the blood settle at the bottom of the tube and that's the red blood cell and then they retransfuse all of the other stuff the plasma the white blood cells the platelets all go back in immediately and then they've cold store the red blood cell Sometime late, often like six weeks later, they'll retransfuse that red blood cell back into the person's body mixed in a saline solution. And of course, in that situation, the, the individual has regrown the red blood cell and they end up with a greater what we call hematocrit. So it's a nice term for you to, for you to use. That it, It's really good for an increasing hematocrit. And that is the percentage of the blood, which is red blood cell, which of course is the oxygen and CO2 for that matter, carrying uh, capacity. Now, what I want to do beyond that is I want to look at the for and against of drug taking. So we're going to make an assumption here that you know the differences between illegal and illegal, uh, legal and illegal substances, let's say creatine, illegal, anabolic steroid, illegal, for example. And what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the ethical argument. So people that argue that drugs should be allowed in sport argue the following, that it levels the playing field. Think that through for a second. That has fairly dramatic implications. That suggests that numerous athletes currently are using these drugs without being caught. And the question, therefore, is asked um, by lots of athletes is did I lose fairly you know if someone finished I don't know fourth in the Olympics for argument's sake or sixth did I lose to athletes that were clean well allowing drugs would perhaps remedy that condition by the way don't think I'm personally arguing for allowing drugs to be legal in sport I'm just giving you the arguments other factors are that making drugs legal leads to a control of substances so rather than an athlete having to get anabolic steroid from some back door uh, some some back door of a gym that can that substance can be much higher quality and that can lead to less threat to things such as health okay things such as health it's worth it, it's worth considering about the other point is that that develops a market so that has an economic advantage okay so that trade could have an economic advantage think it through whether you think that has any relevance or not we would certainly get an up arrow greater spectacular sport so sport would become more powerful more dramatic bigger hits bigger smashes more resistance fewer injury well you, i don't know about fewer injuries you get people who recovered faster from injury for example other points about drugs are that drugs and, and ped use reflect society so basically there's a large proportion of our modern society which is to some degree using or even dependent on alcohol nicotine painkillers antidepressants and even in many cases antipsychotic drugs so you can start to see how sport reflects that general picture and the other point 
is that within sport today, we absolutely have what we call a win culture. The commodity of value, as I mentioned earlier, in sport today is winning, at least in our culture. It's dramatically greater than perhaps it was before. And therefore, it is an inevitability that these drugs are going to become more and more um, relied upon. Now, I just want to quickly address, you know, why would an athlete take a performance enhancing drug? And these are some of the reasons pressure you know, they might feel pressured into it, either because they think others are doing it or even directly a coach pressures them, for example. They do it because it increases their chances of winning to win. They do it to equalize. You know, if everyone else is, the cycling in the 90s, classic example, they do it because there's a culture of it and they do it perhaps because there's a lack of education against it. So those are some of the reasons why an athlete might choose it while it's illegal, okay? But that, you know, it's kind of a different a different model now against the argument or the argument against uh, permitting drugs is that we consider it to be cheating it would be very difficult to move away from that model secondly we ha we still maintain as we discussed before a notion and an importance of sportsmanship well this is clearly not sportsmanship we'd also have as we seem to have allowed in other areas a loss of traditional values so if we permit performance enhancing drugs to uh, be used in sport that traditional value is going to be really lost for good and perhaps even forever more of which in a second this development is going to be uneven you know we're going to have what we'd call that's meant to be a h by the way a tech arms race around drugs you know that the wealthiest nations with the biggest investment programs are going to produce the best designer drugs and they are going to win more frequently and that of course is going to grow, it's going to become a competitive industry in other words and therefore there's going to be more greater more developmental we're also going to have the notion of health risks you know remember that athletes do not take small amounts of epo they do not take small amounts of anabolic steroid they take gigantic amounts of these substances because that's what's going to get them closer to winning the other point against this idea is that there's no return once we permit drugs as being legal in sport there probably is no way back so once we go down that path it's done we're down that path forever now you could argue we're already down that path because athletes are doing it anyway but that's the reality um, now, we could also describe sport might become, and again, I use this word very cautiously, I don't really like using it, but we'd get sort of a notion of freakish performance, unhuman levels of performance, literally. Okay, so that is an argument against, but don't forget that we've got this more spectacular point over here as a positive. We'd also find that um, permitting drugs would shift the problem, it shifts the problem. Okay, because of course the problem here is we've got a win at all costs ethic. I should have put that up here actually. Win at all costs ethic to win. It's a win at all costs ethic. So it shifts the problem simply from being, you know, uh, should athletes be able to um, use anabolic steroid, for example? Well, it's just going to shift the line to what people can and can't use further down that kind of performance enhancing drug root should should you know is the next argument should we allow genetic modification of an individual to get better athletic performance okay that's where the line might become if we did this uh so that leads me to this next point where does it stop where does it stop you know because this is just opening the old pandora's box of course and we create you know, what I think most of us would argue as negative role models. And of course, these are some fairly dramatic problems. Now, we're running out of time here, so I really need to get, move on. I want to talk about WADA briefly. Now, WADA is a really fascinating organization, in my opinion, because, for numerous reasons. I want to kind of, I want to kind of get to some, to some key aspects of this. First of all, I want you to know that with WADA, it is 50% funded by the IOC. So think about WADA as the international body which has responsibility for all um, national anti-doping agencies to get their protocols right. So it's an international body but it's funded by the International Olympic Committee at least by 50%. So of course WADA it's very difficult for them to do anything that would hurt the IOC which perhaps explains why Russia in recent years has only reluctantly and recently been banned from Olympic Games for example even though they're their um, structural, infrastructural drug abuse was absolutely proven. Uh, look at the story of Grigory Rachenko if you're if you're interested. In that. I'm not going to get into it now. Now I also want to talk about the roles of this organisation. So they make 
the band substance list. Okay, so WADA makes the band substance list. So that's really important that we that we know that. We also need to know that WADA funds research. Okay, so WADA is the body which is sort of hoped would stay ahead of the cheats, as it were. Okay, so that's what they do too. And they also delegate, okay? They also delegate. Now, delegate means they pass on responsibility. Well, who do they pass on responsibility to? To national ADAs. And a national ADA, national ADA, it would be something like UCAD, UK Anti-Doping, or ASADA, or USADA in, the, in America. Uh, these sorts of organizations take the, the guidance provided by WADA and they they act upon it within the home nation um, and they also develop what's called the testing methodology okay and i'm going to talk just a little bit about that about that briefly because we're running out of time really we've got a testing methodology so two things on testing we've got the in competition that wada is responsible for at least it gets the, the adas in the, in the countries to do it and it's got out of competition now a couple of other quick details out of competition a couple of other uh, quick things I want you to know. I'll do this one in a nice bright ye yellow. We have a WADA um, implements a urine sample. So a couple of things about that urine sample. First of all, it's witnessed. Second, so you know, someone literally watches you do a wee. Secondly, we have an A, B, a plus a B sample, A plus B sample, so that if the A sample returns a positive, the B sample can verify the positive. Now, that works really well because theoretically, the, the bottles cannot be opened by without cracking the glass. Um, but there's a bit of a problem with that because <laughs> uh, Russia found a way. So anyway, I'll, I'll let you look into that in your, in your own time if you want a bit more information on that particular case. And... Thirdly, the testing is random for that urine sample. Now, for the other area of testing, I want to introduce you to the notion of the biological passport. Now, this is a relatively modern development, biological passport. So this is where blood and urine levels are monitored over time. Blood and urine levels. So, for example, if someone's hematocrit seems to be at um, forty-five percent, and then it spikes up to sixty percent out of nowhere, that's going to indicate that something odd is going on. So, it's all about detecting changes. So, it detects changes, and we could say over time for that one. Um, and it's really good for peptide hormones. Okay, it's really good for peptide hormones. What do we mean by that? EPO and HGH can be detected because you see a spike. And that's really important, okay? Uh, it's also good for blood doping because, for example, a, a spike in hematocrit or red blood cell level is going to be doming, I wrote, uh, blood doping. So it's really effective for those things. So WADA, as you see there, is a really super important agency to try and get these methods correct. So I'm not going to go on about sort of other aspects of WADA, but just, just be aware um, that they do a lot of campaign work. Uh, they've also got sort of advanced testing methodologies. Um, they work in combination with other bodies to ban countries such as Russia, for example. Uh, they apply the rules consistently to different nations and they make a very consistent set of rules. Now, what I want to get to, because we're really short of time, is this answer. Now, right from the start, I have not wanted to give you this and I haven't wanted to give this answer to you as a model answer. But let's just have a look at it together because I want you guys to complete this for me. Athletes of all kinds face the temptation of using PEDs to increase their chance of winning. We agree. Discuss. 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 Discuss the possible impacts of Kate, she's a triathlete, taking performance-enhancing drugs. So what would be the impact for her if she took performance-enhancing drugs? Now, we've been asked to discuss, and I've, as I've said to you on a few other occasions, discuss can mean a couple of different things. Discuss basically means give the main details, talk about the main details. And often with discuss, we want to do one of the following. We want to evaluate which is, you know, given advantages and disadvantages. We want to analyze, which is breaking the answer down and explaining it. We want to compare, and sometimes we want to explain. Okay, so one of the things we need to do when we get a discuss question is try and identify which of these it would be. And for me, the one that jumps out from this question is because it's asked me for the possible impacts, those possible impacts could be positive, 
and they definitely will at least be some of them negative. So for me, that jumps out as an evaluate question. So as a result of that, I'm going to expect certain language to be used in here. So if I'm looking at an evaluate question, I want to expect to read in an answer things like on the one hand and then some content. I'm going to expect to read on the other hand. And, you know, it could be on the one hand, uh, Kate, would, Kate might take EPO and dramatically increase her aerobic performance, being able to maintain higher intensities for longer. On the other hand, you know, she, 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 she may develop bradycardic conditions, which threatens the, her health. You know, we're, we're talking about those kinds of things. We'd also say that an advantage, so this is going to be a classic. So, of course, we're going to expect language such as a disadvantage. Okay, can you see how we might start to structure this answer? A reason to, so a reason to take drugs, you know, it could be she, she feels she wants to level the playing field. A reason not to, and then we might talk about, you know, the, the implications of the WADA testing and the biological passport. Reason not to, she's going to get caught. One implication is, so there's an implication of this behaviour. One implication is, and then she gives the implication, she might get caught through the testing protocol. Another implication is, this one could be positive, for example, you know, she would get, she would turn into a better athlete, at least temporarily. We also want to see things such as, however, comma, this is where you give the other side of the argument afterwards. And we'd also expect to see, comma, space, whereas, you know, the other side of this. But we would definitely expect to see, in conclusion, Comma. If we're giving an evaluate, if we're discussing something, we have to finish with a conclusion. Now, that gives us, in many ways, the shape of what our answer is going to look like. We're going to talk about the positive and the negative impact on Kate, and we're going to do so using that kind of language. The content, we could probably have a really good, 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 go, good go at at this point. Now, the other point I wanted to make to you is that we'd have sort of focal areas. Okay. So in the focal areas, we're now moving into a sort of a notion of analysing, breaking something down. I might do a section which is all about health or health slash performance. Okay, performance would inc increase, but health wouldn't, for example. We might have a, a, a part of our answer, which is that drug taking can lead to an increased chance of winning. Uh, on the other hand, if other athletes are doing this as well, it develops into kind of a tech, ar a tech arm race tech arms race we also might want to talk about the implications for her career okay it might have initial benefits but what about long term we we might want to break this down and talk about her reputation she might become a real star temporarily while her performances increase and get better but the fall as she gets cut as she gets outed and caught for what she's done is going to be disastrous on her reputation we might even want to talk about the law and the ethics of this the law and the ethics of this so if we were to break down let's let's say that we ended with five paragraphs that contained statements that had content in them of that kind with a great conclusion at the end we would be very very close to a really high quality answer and this is my challenge to you can you guys now as we showed you earlier on can you get your answer in on this question now a word of warning if you're the OCR student here Okay, you guys would obviously be looking at your synoptic type response here. So just be aware of that. You may actually be combining this with other areas uh, of the course. Here it's just been asked as one single area. Nevertheless, I think that gives us a great start point. You know, all we'd need to know is have good quality content in these areas, okay, and using this kind of language, and we would make a fabulous, interesting discussion. So I'm looking okay. Okay, let's start focusing on this idea of commercialization. So let me be super clear from the outset. We are going to look at certain aspects and slants of this gigantic topic. And you guys, it's really the responsibility of you and your teachers to take this further, okay? So whether you're one of those edXL A-level bods who's studying this in relation to historical and social context and globalization, whether you are looking at this from the perspective, right, I really need to get to that bit about sponsorship and the advantages and disadvantages, you have to take this a little bit further. The other point I'd make on that one is you've got to be able to give more and broader range of examples than I'm going to provide many today, but you know, examples of what I'm going to talk about I think are really important to this argument and to, the, and to expressing these ideas. 
Um, the other point I was going to make about commercialization is I consider it personally to be a kind of a, um, a, a kind of a door a doorway to wider areas where we look at media we look at economics we look at that's meant to say economics by the way we look at sponsorship we look at all this sort of notion and commercialization is a gateway to that now today we're going to focus quite a bit on the media aspect of that but please don't get confused there are many other journeys that we could have taken now we are going to make an assumption that commercialization has increased and it has increased and i will write this dramatically dramatically in recent years so we need to start understanding what are the factors that have caused this increase in commercialization of sport and of physical activity and by that we mean that, com that commercialization has meant the sport and physical activity more of which in a second has become a commodity a private commodity commod i'll try that again a private commodity with a profit motive okay so that is definitely the case and we want to understand why so what are the, some of the factors that have caused that? So the first one I want to draw your attention to, and perhaps it's the, the focal point and it's the fulcrum for everything, is that we've got an up arrow. Up arrow means increase, by the way. Make sure you know that. Increase in public, increase in public sport spectator, spectatorship. Now, the notion of spectatorship is as long as humanity itself, I'm sure. But the idea of public sport spectatorship in the last 10 to 20 years has dramatically increased. Now, of course, that has happened in the context of things like the internet, live streaming, social media. But sport spectat spectatorship has dramatically increased. So sports have become, for example, global events. Think about something like Olympics. Champions League finals, uh, pay-per-view big boxing matches, McGregor Mayweather, say, for argument's sake. We've also, therefore, got the idea of a mass market. Okay, So sport, which was a recreational and, in some cases, professional uh, movement activity 50 years ago, is now a mass market entertainment industry. And, of course, that has led to a commercialization of that commodity. This sort of language is the language you need to be using when you write about these things. Now, we can also look at this in relation to an increase in advertising, an increase in in advertising so as a result of that the the sponsor the advertiser they are experiencing because of this they are experiencing a, power, a greater audience for their product you know whether it's mastercard putting their billboards around football pitches or whether it's monster sponsoring the ufc or whatever it happens to be monster drinks i mean um whatever that is it's it's increased the audience the, the increasing audience has become a profitable factor for those companies now we've also got notions like the sponsor the advertiser increases their income otherwise why would they do it okay they, they might do it from the perspective of um, good for the community possibly but really, I suppose what's happening there is we've got those companies who are capable of making more profit. And the other point I'd make about advertising is, and I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail, actually, is that that relationship can be positive or negative, more of which in a few moments' time. So the increase in advertising has led to an increase in commercialization. Now, I know someone out there can say to me, but James... The, the increase in advertising hasn't led to the greater market. The greater market's led to the greater advertising. Yes, these things are cyclical. We're going to look at that exact point in a few moments' time. But for now, let's leave it in this place. Next point I'd like to make is we've got a gigantically increasing media interest. Okay, so why would media companies be interested in sport? Why would that be? What's your answer to that question? Why would um, a YouTube channel, uh, why would an online newspaper, why would they cover extensively sport? Reflect on that a second. But with, with media interest, we are talking about different types of companies. TV, you know, is TV dying today? Is, it, is TV finished in the modern era? But it's still a major player right at this moment. We're certainly talking about internet-based companies. You know, a classic example would be something like TMZ. If you don't know what TMZ is, congratulations you're a better person for it but nevertheless tmz is an example of that and of course we've got the growth in things such as live streaming okay live streaming which i think we can be pretty confident about that in 10 years is going to be probably the predominant way for sport and sport entertainment to be viewed i think that's fairly obvious so 
Let me come back to this question. Why are the media, it, media companies interested? Because it's profitable, because people click on it, because people like the story and the sensationalism. So this has led to an increase in commercialization. One of the reasons that sport is commercial is that you can sell a story. You can you can sell the story of um, you know Johnny Triple Jumper who um, does something wrong in his spare time, and it goes all over the newspapers and it gets people to click on it, right? Or it could be you know this comeback story, Lance Armstrong before things went slightly wrong. Um, Lance Armstrong was a great case of that, wasn't he? You know, the comeback story, the comeback hero. These things sell and people like these narratives and stories. Now, kind of already touched on this one, but we've got an increase. Let me just differentiate between an increase in advertising and an increase in sponsorship. Okay, with sponsorship, we are talking about a business relationship, a business relationship, important terms. And specifically... We're talking about the sponsor receiving greater exposure, very much like the advertiser. I mean, we can almost see these as the same point. And they even go on to sponsor things other than sports and teams. Think about an example such as a, a different stadia. Think about how many sports stadia you can name that are named after a product, a service, a financial industry, an airline. These, of th these kind of things is pretty common. And finally, I want to bring our attention to the notion of professionalism 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 now with professionalism of course we're talking there about the tendency for sports to professionalize their athletes in the modern era what does that mean it increases the quality they've become full-time it's better for the tv for the stream it looks better to the audience to the consumer so this means that there's more money to enable this we are talking about the sport increasing in its quality professional athletes on the whole produce better quality sport than non-professional athletes we are talking about an increase in status professional sports people have very high status in our society athletes are able to ft training full-time training that's what that means athletes can do that so quality goes up and athletes begin to live what we call a performance lifestyle. Now, that performance lifestyle, in comparison to what I talked about recently, when was it on Monday, um, about sort of that traditional God-given talent amateurism model, we've got a very different model here. So these are some of the crucial factors. It's not meant to be exhaustive. We could go on and on and on here. I'm trying to give you the big picture. Now, let's have a look at what this or how this impacts on different people so how does this impact on different people so first of all let's look at the player well players or performers they become role models that's good right that that's a nice thing that's a good aspect of commercialization the global market players performers increase their earnings in many cases not all let's be clear we also get the idea of fame and status for these now uh, internationally known individuals we also know that these people move on to other opportunities beyond their performance, whether it's into media, whether it's into punditry. Those sorts of things become opportunities outside of um, the sport. And that, of course, leads us to a notion of the career. Sports careers on the whole are very short. So therefore, a career through the global market, through the media, through that kind of thing becomes useful. I mean, look, look how many um, ex-sports people uh, act as kind of you know um what would you call it like uh symbols of what they used to be you know i, I looked at something least recently i went to an fc barcelona football match and i got the option i didn't do it but i got the option to pay i think it was five thousand euro to go and sit next to an ex-player and watch the game together now i don't know who that ex-player would have been but i don't know who that person is it's a bit of an odd thing so these these people can make money off the back of the globalization after their career ends. Anyway, we want to look at negatives all the time. What's bad about this for the performer? Well, they experience pressure. I mean, it's a huge word for us, that one. They might be tempted into poor behavior. Think back to what we talked about recently on deviancy. They might suffer, especially in the modern era, a lack of privacy. Think about the direct access that social media gets people, for example. And these individuals are judged. Okay, so they are judged within this more commercial, globalized model. Let's have a look at the impact on the coach. Well, the coach, that's not the color I wanted. Hang on, that one. The coach might experience the opportunity for a global search, both for their own work, but the, the, the ability for them to globally search um, high-performing individual players and performers. Um, great examples in rugby union, scouring uh, the Polynesian islands for rugby players, for example. 
We've also got the fact that for the coaches, they experience increased wages in the main. They experience increased opportunities, including international opportunities. Think how many coaches with uh, non-British accents work in British sport. It's very, very common, right? And presumably it's the same with British coaches going elsewhere. Or is it? Um, so we've got that notion too. And we've also, I mean, if I say here, we've got the idea of a global job market for a really good coach. I mean, that must be really exciting, right? That's a very positive thing. But what are the negatives? Well, there's pressure. There's our word again. They experience what we call a hire and fire mentality. You know, if they're not getting results, they are likely to get the sack. By definition in sport, there has to be many losers. Therefore, it turns the cycle of coaches, managers, whatever, continually being recycled through different posts. Some sports are worse for that than others, right? But it's very common, a higher and fine mentality. This leads to a lack of security. You know, will I have the job? Will I have that job? Now, I'm sure some of you can point at the coach who got fired six months into their Premier League football management contract and um, they got $8 million or whatever because the, the, the club sacked them and, and broke the contract. Yeah, that does happen. But don't forget that behind that person, there are countless coaches, physios, all kinds of people who don't get that right. Okay, so it's something you to, for you to be aware of. Uh, we also get increased scrutiny on the coaches, you know, whether it's about results or about um, uh, behavior and lifestyle. And what this means is that for many coaches, they have no choice but to chase what we're going to call the short term win, you know, get success immediately. Because otherwise, my kind of my job is on the line. What about for the official? Well, the positives for the official are they get tech support. You know, whether it's um, radio communication, whether it's video replay, uh, whether it's <coughs> Hawkeyes and, and ball tracking stuff, uh, timers that electronic in athletics and go down to the, uh, the uh, it, it's down to the millisecond, I think, um, and so on and so on. So that helps. Coat, uh, officials as well, I'm talking about think people like referees here, of course, they experience better opportunities, okay? And specifically, we can make the argument that they experience an increase in wages because of the commercial nature of it. And they do have the opportunity of professionalism, professional, professionalization. Okay, they can go full time within their uh, refereeing, umpiring, whatever the sport it is they do. What's the negative? Well, guess what? They experience pressure. Guess what? They experience increased scrutiny. You know, every decision in certain sports can be judged. Was it right? Was it wrong? Um, that, that, that referee is terrible. It happens all the time. We're also talking here about potentially a, a, a notion of humiliation. And I can think of a few examples. Look for your own. We've even got the notion of a scapegoat. You know, the, the, the player, the performer, the coach, the manager, they simply go, well, the referee was telling, we, we lost today and lost the big match and my job's on the line, but it's all down to the referee. The scapegoat is also there. Now, for the audience, we have a different model again. For the audience, think about the fan. Some positives, they get increased coverage, as we've mentioned already, more of media stuff in a few moments' time. They get constant access to their heroes. Think social media in the modern world, for example. They get access to very entertaining... Uh, sport. The problem with entertainment is that the, the another word could be distracting or distraction. More of which in a few moments' time. Um, in fact, no, it's not in a few moments' time. I'm going to I'm going to uh, write it now. So the experience of distraction, we might call it catharsis, sort of stress relief, um, um, getting out of your own lifestyle for a moment and living something different. Now you might want to ask, well, why is it like that? Okay, and is this distraction positive or does it just paper over the cracks? There's some big conversations to have there. And of course, we've got notions here like social media, you mentioned it already, and the fact that being an audience, being a fan is now an international activity. Okay, going to um, matches and competitions abroad is, is an example of that. Now, the positives, the fan, more of which in a second, becomes the consumer. They're no longer the fan, they're now the consumer, more of which briefly. Um, 
cost goes up. I mean, that's been quite dramatic in certain sports. I go to um, live football sometimes. I, I, I spend, um, this is going to sound a bit showy off, I spend quite a lot of time in uh, Barcelona because it's where my partner is from. And I go to their football matches reasonably often. For the last 15 years since I've been going there, the tickets that I've tended, tended to buy have gone from 19 euros up to about 119 euros. Now, you can say inflation happens over 15 years. That's true. But that's a dramatic increase, a dramatic increase in cost to go and watch those games. So that's difficult. So we get this increase in cost. We get the decrease in live attendance. So people will stay away, especially from the non-important game, if... You know, for example, it's been heavily covered in the media. And we also get the notion of disproportionate access. The sports that are likely to be commercially successful, think rugby, cricket, football, um, those are going to have disproportionate coverage, disproportionate money available to them. I'm running out of space. Let me go down slightly. So we've also got here notions that uh, stereotypes can be repeatedly shown to the audience and reinforced. We also... <coughs> have the idea that many people build up role models as the audience members but role models fail and that can be a big disappointment to people okay that can be a huge dis disappointment to people finally on this <laughs> finally in this area let's have a look at what the impact is for the sport well we know the sport gets more coverage so it's more visible it's more of a central feature of society the sport gets more investment this seems very positive right the sport can use that in in money for good things the sport quality goes up, okay? Attract better players, uh, players become professional. That increases the quality, which increases the saleability of the model. We can attract, or the sport can attract the best performers. I just mentioned that. Okay, I guess um, men's soccer is a good example of that. Uh, the WSL Women's Super League soccer is also becoming a good, good example of that, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> and finally, the sport increases in status. Now, there are some negatives. There always are, right? This is disproportionate. This model kind of works for, let's say, our football example, our golf. But does it work for field hockey? Does it work for netball? To be fair, netball's done really well recently. We've also got the notion that in, for the sport, if there's poor behavior, it's highlighted. Poor behavior is highlighted. We've also got that the sport has format changes. Okay, it has to become commercially viable, so shortens, changes the rules, makes it more impacting, spectacular, more force, more power. These sort of things happen to the format of the sport. We get a loss of tradition. We've mentioned this a little bit yesterday, a loss of tradition. On the whole, we see it as a negative. Perhaps you see it as a positive. It might be your opinion. But we do get a loss of values. Does this mean we move more towards gamesmanship, even potentially deviancy? And, of course, that leads us to think about the notion of a win-at-all-cost mentality win at all costs and of course that is relevant for the coach and the performers as well of course and then we also get again the, 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 the notion that sports can reinforce stereotypes and my last point is that the sport can become dependent 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 let me check that dependent i'll confirm that in a minute martha's very good at grammar and so she'll confirm that for me i'm sure dependent i think it's amt anyway so there we go woof massive effort oh, what a lot of words so let's have a look at a question. We're going to have to go quick here. Netball has experienced a significant rise in commercialization in recent years. We agree. Discuss the possible impact on Julie. She's our, our netball star, of course. The fans that come to watch her and the sport of netball. So basically, we want to take the performer. We want to take the audience. And we want to take the sport and judge whether... This has been good or not. Well, what have we got here? We have got the performer, we have got the audience, and we have got the sport. Okay, so we have that content ready to go. Now, I'm not going to waste your time by writing in front of you. So what I want to do now is I want to discuss, discuss. Remember with discuss, it's asking for a couple of things. It could be asking us to evaluate, you know, giving strengths and weakness. It could be asking us to analyze, break something down and explain it. It could be asking us to describe it could be asking us to explain, often with analysis, this is the case. It could be asking us to compare. But what we see here is we've been given the groupings of Julie, the fans, and the sport. So we know it's an analyse question, break this thing down into three. And in this case, because it's the impact, for me, this lends itself to an evaluation. What are the positives and negatives? So remind yourself 
that when you're doing an evaluation, you are talking about strength, weakness, or advantage, disadvantage, pros and cons, you can use that. You're using language such as on the one hand, on the other hand, you make a point and then you make a subsequent point, which is, however, and of course, what you're going to do there, say the other side of this is, you can also say things like comma space, whereas you make a point and you say, you know, um, uh, it, it's positive for Julie because she increases fame and status, whereas this can also be negative because it can lead to increased pressure. OK, so you're making that point uh, for uh, on, on the strengths and weaknesses uh, analysis, okay? Or strengths and weaknesses evaluation, let me be clear. And then what I th the other thing I think on this question is you need three parts. So part one is going to be about the impact on Julie, you know, on the impact of the performer. Part two is going to be the impact on the fan, the audience. Part three is going to be the impact uh, on the sport. Now, we've just covered a lot of material on that. But, of course, we're going to have a part four, which is in conclusion. Okay, and you guys are going to make... A judgment on whether you think overall this is a positive or a negative uh, based on the arguments that you present so for me we're well prepared to answer that question just a health warning on this question okay remember that if you are that OCR group you know we've kind of put this in as your 20 marker we know in reality that your 20 marker is going to be presented in that kind of synoptic fashion okay so we're not we're not going there in this session we're just looking at this as a, as a, as a, a question to a command we're going to cover synoptic for you OCR guys in another context okay because otherwise we get distracted away from the guys who are doing the AQA and the Edexcel stuff so <clears throat> it's a nice question I wholly encourage you to submit an answer to us have a go at that write it and see what sort of quality you can come out with Okay, so we're on to part two here. The golden triangle and the media. It's an enormous topic. We're going to, again, we're going to fire over the surface of this and get you some really great content. You guys need to take a little bit further, I feel. So a couple of things that I really want to sort of drive home within this conversation. <clears throat> the first one, excuse me. The first one is that this golden triangle idea, it sees sport as a, I'm just going to change colour here, as a private commodity okay as a private commodity and that is a com if i spelled it right it would help, always help wouldn't it a private commodity and what we mean by that is it's something to sell it's something to be bought and sold a private commodity that means that sport in this context is not something for you it's something for the people that make profit through business okay so get that in your mind now you can see that as a really good thing that's absolutely fine there are good things about that okay it, as we said already increases quality increases status increases awareness increases exposure these are potentially very very good things but we also have to be prepared to criticize this my second point is that this um is really squarely driven by what we call a profit motive Okay, again, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with the notion of profit within a capitalistic structure. Profit basically means that um, people were prepared to pay more for something than it costs to produce it. That is a good thing. Okay, that means that thing is good. Okay, so it's not intrinsically bad, but we have to address that changes the nature of what we assume to be sport. And that is where I think there's a very interesting conversation. And finally, I need to ask this question, where does the money come from? And I'm not going to immediately answer that for you. Where does the money come from? Uh, within this structure, where do you believe that all the money that goes to the star athlete or the big club or the media company or the sponsor, where do you think that money originates from? And therefore, you can get to a kind of an interesting conversation by answering that. And I'll leave that question open and we'll address it in a moment. Now, onto the golden triangle itself. I want to sort of emphasize this by looking at, exam at an example. And I'm going to give you an example of the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. This is this MMA organization based in North America in Las Vegas, but has fighters from all over the world that compete in events. Okay, so this mixed martial art rules. Now, I know some of you probably don't like that sport but I'm choosing it because I think it represents something particularly interesting in the modern era more of which in a few moments time so we have the elite sport notice this word elite the golden triangle seems to fail miserably when we have general sport non-elite sport it doesn't hold up so we have the elite sport in the ultimate fighting championship and some notion of the best fighters on the planet right okay so I guess someone could argue that but you know what I mean the media companies that are involved are media companies like 
Fox Sport which is owned by News Corporation Murdoch for example we have BT Sport okay which is you know in the UK that's how it's sort of televised we have online media companies like TMZ I mentioned them earlier we have um a YouTube uh, channels that produce things like Embedded, which is a pre-event one-week um, TV show via YouTube, which sort of hypes up what's about to happen. We have startup media companies like the Mac Life, for example, that cover this sort of thing. And we even have independent channels, numerous independent channels, that cover these particular events. On the sponsorship side, I don't know if my yellow's going to work on this light. On, oh, I should be okay. We have things like Bird Light. By the way, if you're looking at this on a big screen in the classroom and you can't see that yellow, you teach that there, you need to change your bulbs. I'll read it out nice and neatly to you, okay? But we've got Bud Light, a, a beer sponsor. We've got Reebok, who is one of the main sponsors and the kit sponsors. We have Monster Energy Drinks, which sponsor the uh, um, numerous aspects of this. We have Harley Davidson Motorcycles. By the way, I'm not promoting any of these companies, you understand. I'm just telling you these are the sponsors. We have Dodge Cars. We have, for example, I don't even know how to say this, but they're called Science. don't even know what they do. It's l written like this, I think. Okay, Science. And then we have companies like Toyo Tires. So you can see all of these companies are desperate to be associated with this sport. You might want to think why. And then we get to the interesting point. This commodity, mentioned that private commodity earlier, <coughs> excuse me, is able to sell its rights to media companies. Sponsors pay both the media companies and the elite sport for their rights for their products to be associated with it. And as a result, money swirls around this system. How do you write dollar signs? Money swirls around this system and it makes it profitable for everybody because this elite sport is popular. And it comes back to where does the money come from? And the answer to that question, of course, is the consumer. Now, who is the consumer in this relationship? The fan. Now, I'm not saying this is intrinsically bad or negative, but this money here originates with people like you and me if we follow football or rugby or netball or UFC or whatever. That money originates from us and our tendency to do work and produce economic activity by working all week. Now, that's an interesting concept. Now, we also want to define the golden triangle. is the commercial relationship between elite sport, sponsors, and media companies. And we want to obviously take that a little bit further. But I think the first thing we have to do is understand the cyclical relationship. Now, if we took any aspect of that away, let's say that this wasn't covered on the media then of course this is going to disappear, isn't it? Let's say that uh, UFC wasn't considered elite sport. Well, now these things are going to disappear because people aren't going to want to... Uh, the, the, the base is not there. The money's not coming through from the consumer and therefore there's not enough relevance to the model. Now, we also want to have a look at the effects of the media. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to do this pretty rapidly in truth and I'm really um, scratching the surface, okay? So positive effects of the media is that people get more access to sport. That's a C there, believe it or not. People get more access to sport. Think about social media as an example of that. We, we have the notion that we have more wealth being generated and therefore performers amongst others can develop that wealth. We also have the idea of increased economic activity. You know, economic activity around the sport is uh, is actually good for a society as a whole. We have the notion that the sport via the media is entertainment. It's presented in a really clean, modern way. There's numerous angles, improved cameras, better technology, better review. It's entertaining for the spectator. We've got the notion that this is positive because the sponsor sells. They sell their product, okay? Now, assuming it's something that's useful, then presumably that's a good thing. The sponsor sells. We've also got the idea that this model causes sports to update. Sports don't just keep their traditional structure. They change and update to the modernizing times because of the pressure that's applied this way. And we also get the idea of, and this seems like a bit of an odd one really, but we get the idea of what we call storytelling. You know, human beings really like to be caught, to be told stories and sport and media involvement in sport is a very um, good example of that. Here's the hype between manager A and manager B. They hate each other and here's come and watch our match. You know, that would be a little example of storytelling. Or we get personally invested in the role model athletic superstar, you know, and we want to see them perform. We feel personally invested in those people. But there are negatives. 
the sport becomes non-stop. Okay, now again, that could be a positive for some people, but non-stop is quite a distraction. Okay, so people experience a lot of distraction through sport from perhaps, you know, spending time with family, people they care about, that kind of stuff. We've got the notion of cost. Cost rockets, okay, within this model, especially to the fan. We've got the notion of consumerism. You, know, you come to our football stadium, we're going to sell you, what did I say before, 119 euro ticket, and we're going to market to you relentlessly with adverts everywhere. We're going to charge you seven quid for a hot dog. We're going to get the most money per head, per fan possible out of you every time. And there's some issues with that. We get a decrease in live audience. We get a decrease in live audience. People perhaps watch it through the media and not in, the, say, the stadia. We can even make an argument that this becomes something which is no longer sport. Okay, so sport in its traditional sense, as we've mentioned before, is this amateur ideal. It's this middle class 19th century ideal of fair play, of taking part. What we're talking about here is an overemphasis of something like winning and competitiveness. We move towards subscription costs and pay per view, subscription, pay per view. Now, again, you could see that as a positive, okay? Perhaps that ups the quality of what's been shown, but it, it's a cost passed on to consumers, isn't it? We get the notion of sensationalism. You know, they don't just tell you the story of, you know, this team beat that team by a certain number of points, but, oh, the referee today, how could he or she have made that decision? It's a disgrace. They sensationalise these things to tell the story. We've got the... This is a nice word for you to get into your answers. We've got the notion of clickbait. Clickbait. I'm sure you youngsters can tell me more about it than I can tell you, but you know what I mean. We've got this idea that um, the sport becomes something which is just getting people to click on stuff and, and take part in commercial activity. We get the movement potentially towards deviancy, more of which was in our very last live session, of course. And then we get the development of pressure, and that pressure can lead to all kinds, of course, of deviancy on the, on the athletes. So look, there's some positive and negative aspects of media involvement there. I do want to chuck something in the middle, which is the development of technology. I mean, I was watching a football match uh, yesterday, and I was watching it on my phone. I have like a, a, a an app which it's a BT Sport app, basically. I don't want to advertise it because why would you want it? Why would you want it? But um, it allowed me to for instant replays to change the angle to. to and commentary it allowed me to um, to use their DVR to go back in time, watch it a bit more. It was a it, it was interesting how that changed the experience for me as the spectator and the consumer. Okay, so you know you might want to even give arguments, uh, you might even want to give experiences of that. Now, one thing we can say is that media coverage has changed. There's no question about that. Media coverage has changed over the last twenty years. Now, if you're born, oh, you guys, what you born eighteen years ago, seventeen years ago, I suppose. So you know, for you, the world without the internet, the world without you. The, the world without TMZ probably seems like a strange world, but for us, fogies, for us, the strange one is the one that's in place right now. So we have to look at how this change has happened. So some real critical points here. The first one I would say is that sport media has switched from analog to digital. Okay, now that might not seem major to begin with. You might think, oh, okay, I haven't got an analog TV anymore. I've got a digital cable TV, fine. But the point is, once you get digital access uh, to audiovisual information, it, of course, becomes continuous and on-demand. Scheduling becomes less and less and less important. So it changes that nature of how we can access. Clear other points, of course, are the expansion of the internet. Expansion of the internet. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to do the foggy line again, but, you know, you have to understand that this is a modern development. This is not something that's been in place for a long time. Many of the teachers who, if they're any, we're close to my age, for example, they'll remember a world where, okay, I'd heard of that internet thing, but I, you know, I'd never seen it. I'd never touched it. And then, of course, there was an explosion of activity. Uh, I, I don't want to give a time frame, so I'll probably get it wrong, but in the last 20 to 25 years, it's been gigantic. Um, that leads, of course, to streaming, pay-per-view, um, online media channels, the death of television. We've also got BB, and by that I mean <coughs> broadband, in at least greater than 80% of homes. That means that a strong internet signal is coming in to the vast majority of people in our society. That means that people can watch, consume their sport that way. We've got the success of media companies 
media company success. Probably the classic example is Sky Sports, but we can look at more modern examples of Fox Sport, of BT Sport. These media companies make money. You can also link it to something like online media. I've mentioned things like TMZ. I've mentioned things like MacLife. I mean, you've probably got many, many others that you can tell me about that I don't know about, but they're ones that are in my sort of horizon. We've also got the success of sponsors. Let's just see again. Success of sponsors. Sponsors make money so more sponsors get attracted into this genre. We've got the notion of globalization, especially important for you at Excel guys who study this in detail, the globalization of sport. So the market develops into the entire world that of course potentially has a very dramatic impact in <clears throat> potential productivity and profit. Uh, other points, we clearly have the increase in technology and the technology I want to particularly focus on here, we could choose numerous examples, but the one I want to um, focus on here is the proliferation, that's a big word, isn't it? Proliferation, proliferation of mobile devices. And again, you might be thinking, James, but obviously that's always been the case, hasn't it? No, um, mobile telephones have been around for a, a fair chunk of time. I remember the first time I ever saw one. <laughs> uh, am I going to talk about this? The first time I ever saw one, I was on a, I was on a date as a 17-year-old as in Kings Lynn in Norfolk, uh, and it would have been in 1992. And that was the first time I ever... I've got the right date there? 1992. And I went out on this date with this uh, lovely young lady and uh, in her pocket she had this mobile phone and it literally bent her spine. It was so heavy. She literally had lateral flexion to the left because she had it in the inside pocket of her coat. I'm not exaggerating. It was enormous. But of course what we've got now is we've got mobile devices, smart telephones that can effectively stream continuously through 4G, through Wi-Fi. Um, uh, sport content through the media and that of course changes the way we consume things I hadn't thought about her for a long time uh, now then we also get format changes I've mentioned this already okay but we also get format changes so what do we mean by this we get format changes through the media so we go to digital we go to pay-per-view we go to YouTube. Is the biggest sporting event of this year going to happen on YouTube between two YouTubers? Some of you know what I'm talking about. It, it's kind of a bit boring and tedious to me personally, but people tell me this is going to be a gigantic event, this boxing match. Okay, So is that going to be the biggest sporting event of the year? Things have changed, right? And we get to an ocean where effectively sport is on demand so these are some of the factors that lead to a change in media coverage let me repeat i am skating over the surface we really need to go deeper on these points but and, and for that you have to go to the elevator.com and take more detailed information on this but it gives you a good big picture now i've got to uh quickly change canvas because i've got my uh, question on a different canvas give me a few seconds i'll be straight back to you Okay, good. We are ready to go again. So need to be quick here because we don't have long. So this is an interesting question for me because it asks us straight away, Josh is, a, is an elite sprinter. We agree. We know a little bit about Josh and he's an elite sprinter. He's performing at a very good level. So therefore, we can start to look at the, the changing media coverage and the impact of commercialization, these sorts of notions on, on, on him. Evaluate. All right, before we get further into the question, can I just clearly tell you what evaluate means? <clears throat> it means provide. It, pro it means provide strengths and weaknesses or advantages, disadvantages, and reach a conclusion. Okay, that is what this is. Now, I know that a lot of you are told, right, well, you first you've got to describe everything and then uh, you've got to explain it. So I've heard this idea method, identify those points. Then, um, uh, then you have to describe those points for the D bit, then you have to explain them, then you have to analyze. No, no. What we're talking about here is you provide a strengths and weakness analysis and you reach a conclusion. Let me be clear about something. If you discuss the strengths and weaknesses of media coverage in this case, you cannot avoid describing it. It is intrinsic to that process. I'll repeat that. If you give a good quality strengths and weakness analysis of, or advantages and disadvantages evaluation, of the impact of media coverage on, on Josh and his lifestyle, just pumps in his lifestyle, then <clears throat> by nature, you're going to be describing this concept, okay? So for me, 
the key thing I want to do is I want to learn this material from the perspective of an evaluative frame. Okay, and okay, I know you guys are revising right now, so you don't want me to bang on about this, but I really encourage the teachers out there, you know, if we are learning concept A, B, C, D, E, whatever, how are we giving opportunities to students to develop the behavior and the functional thinking pattern of evaluation before they come to write an answer like this one? Because otherwise they do have to identify, describe, explain, and then analyze some things but we want to be able to do that all in one go anyway that's just me now the other thing i think about here is i want to see both sides of the argument okay it's really intrinsic to an evaluation process i want to see both sides of an argument okay so we have to give those positives and negatives so we're going to of course as i mentioned before we're going to be using language such as an advantage a disadvantage we're going to be using this language in our response, we're going to be using um, in support, contrary to this, I was trying to give you some different options than the one I gave you earlier, contrary to this, I mean get ready for this mad one here, antithetically, Woo! antithetically, what does that mean James, Antith antith that's a h there, Antithetically, that's a H there. Antithetically means on the opposite side. Antithetically speaking, the opposite thing is the following. Okay, so it's in opposition, antithetically, in support, country. We've got our comma space, whereas we've got our however comma. We know these things are going to lead us to be evaluative. And we always, of course, finished with in conclusion. And again, in this question, if we look at it, we're being asked about Josh's performances and Josh's lifestyle. So how many paragraphs are we going to have here? We're going to have, no, well, you might have more, but as a minimum, you would have um, pluses and minuses on performance. You know, so he'd be able to turn professional. He'd be able to make more money. He'd be able to have better medical support, biomechanics support, and so on and so on. So we'd also have the weaknesses there. He might have a tendency to go to, to, to overtrain. Uh, he might have a tendency towards positive deviancy. Uh, he might have a tendency on his performance to, to compete too often, to try and make money, all these sorts of things. We're going to have two. We're going to have positives and negatives on lifestyle. Okay, so on the one hand, he's going to be earning more money, he's going to have more wealth, he's going to have better status, he's going to be more renowned. On the negative side, on the negative side, the career is short. You know, what does he do afterwards? We've got the fact that he loses his privacy, we've got the fact that he experiences pressure, that he might take bad decisions. He might be become what was originally a positive role model to a negative role model. He might experience sensationalism through the media. All of these things are, pos are possible. And finally, we reach the last essential feature, which is in conclusion. And we have to draw that argument together. So my challenge to you really is, assuming you know the material we've covered, and a bit more, you do need a bit more, let's be honest about that, because in, in, in the amount of time we've got here, we're not realistically going to cover every aspect of the media, every aspect of commercialization. But within this situation, can you have enough content knowledge and a clear understanding of what it means to evaluate, use this uh, facilitating language and then be able to structure your answer neatly and effectively and I'm pretty sure you can and I would also encourage you not to overthink this now again I repeat especially for your OCR guys you guys obviously have to take into account the extra element of the synoptic feature to your extended writing. Again, I'm not going to get into that here. I see my job right now is developing your content and get developing your basic awareness of what each skill within the exam is. But I think we're making good moves towards that. Okay, I really encourage you. I really encourage you to please submit to us an answer to this question. Okay, I would be really interested to see how you write this thing. Okay, we've got numerous model answers to this kind of question. Um, but I'd like to see how you guys do it, and I'd like to see if you use this kind of structure. Can I also emphasize these little fellas here? I haven't put those there accidentally. Okay, they are correct. Okay, that actually should be one there. I got one wrong. They actually are correct, and you guys should be, and you should have the right to learn how to use grammar effectively, okay? So it might not seem the most important thing to you right now just before your exam, I accept that. You might be thinking, James, come on. That's fine, I understand. But let's also acknowledge the reality that we are, we are, um, we are 13 years into an educational process and you guys 
you know, you should be expected and given the information to do this thing well. Okay, so there's a little standard I'm trying to set. I'm probably hated at this very moment, so I'll stop. Um, so one of the really kind of emblematic things that we can do with our pre-industrial sport, our emergence history of sport, is that we can make a comparison or we can look at distinctions between two different types of activities that would have been involved uh, or would have been taken part in at that time. And there's probably nothing more emblematic than the comparison between these two activities. So we're looking at some notion of a comparison between mob football and real tennis. Now, I've highlighted the concept of social class, which is central to a, an awful lot of you with regard to um, your studies on this particular topic. But I'm also going to be looking at things such as literacy. I'm also going to be looking at things such as gender. I'm also going to be looking at things like transport and communications amongst other factors and we could also look at things like wealth or disposable income and how that's an L there believe it or not uh, and how these things have influenced how these games were played and remain still played today in truth so if you're unsure of what mob football and real tennis are I haven't I haven't included those sort of quintessential typical images within this uh, little presentation I would encourage you to go and google them if you're on a computer now google real tennis google mob football and you'll come up with some kind of intriguing images I'm not going to bother with that here because I'm just going to assume that you've seen them before but what I am going to do is I'm going to describe these concepts in relation to social class so let's take mob football first of all how do we how do we describe this pre-industrial form of kind of invasion game well let's first of all make sure we know it's that it's an invasion game um, modern in invasion games would be uh, things like rugby netball uh, basketball association football and so on and so on there's um, those are our modern versions and it's what we would call a force-based game now here we have um, here we have a, a, an interesting concept a force based game represents the social class which is playing it and it's the first indication that we might be looking at distinctive groups between the two two areas because the game was force based we can be pretty confident it reflected the participants being the working class or you can use the term the lower class i'm sure you could probably use the peasant class as well and have completely acceptable uh, correct marks for that so working class or lower class working class really is a term that um, became more typical in the 19th century um, through uh, well numerous methodologies not 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 nearly the um, the sort of the internal situation of, of migration into urban sort of factory dwellings. We'll talk about this a bit later on. Um, but it also, if you look at the works of uh, Karl Marx, for example, this had significant influences in how we refer to these these groups of people at different times. Anyway, so lower class or peasant class or working class, all of those would give you a a, a reasonable distinction. Now, real tennis, of course, is kind of different. First of all, it's what we'd call a refined game. Now, yes, you can call it a net wall game, a refined net game. I meant to write a refined game, a refined game. Now, that brings us back to mob football, because mob football wasn't just an invasion game. It's what we call a mob game. Now, that's obvious because it's got mob in the title, okay? So we've got this mob game or this invasion game. We have this refined game with real tennis. And this game is what we would call skill-based. So again, think that that represents the social class that was participating in this. And of course, here we, we are talking about the upper class. You can use the term gentry. You could even use the term aristocracy. You could even go further and talk about the landowning aristocracy and so on and so on. So the, the nature of the sport as participated in reflected the social class of the people who were taking part in it and we see that straight away let's go back to our mob football for a second we can describe it as violent and rowdy okay more of which in a second we can describe it even as dangerous okay and we can even say that this was kind of reflective of the of the of the lifestyle of people of the time, sort of uh, as death, the feature of life. Of um, so, I mean, give for example that the people playing this game would have slaughtered their own animals. Think about how that would differ from today, for example, where we have a very sanitized experience of life, where we tend not to see blood and gore day to day to day, unless we're on computer games, of course, and then. What we tend to find here is in, in this group of people, the, the sports represented that kind of gory nature to life. Now, I'm not saying 
what is right and wrong within that you make your own judgment but it sort of was reflective of that way now on this real tennis uh side we've got what we would call civilized and i must put that into invert commas because civilization is of course uh, a subjective concept it was a civilized or what we might call a respectable game we could say of course it was non-violent i mean it's, it's fairly obvious point to make but this again reflected the social class in which uh, that was taking part in it now mob football had simple unwritten rules okay think about how that represents literacy levels of the people that were taking part in it um, whereas our real tennis had what we often call as complex rules complex rules okay so very complex i mean today I've, I've read a bit of the rules of real tennis i don't completely understand it from what i can figure out it, it's a it's a combination of squash Cross, crossed with that uh, ITV quiz show, The Chase. That's my personal interpretation of it. You make your own. But we've got this notion of this complex rule base. Now, again, you can use the term codified. Now, I think in terms of real tennis, codification is a bit of a misleading notion because it was more a set of rules by agreement, by education, rather than sort of um, a formalized governing body at this point that was, that was uh, decided upon this. Now, other points that we really should make here is that mob football was played in natural facilities over fields through rivers over brooks and so on so this natural facility would have been a characteristic of uh, mob football whereas in the real tennis example we have a specialized facility and of course we can call that a court okay so think about and this applies to rules as well. Think about the notion of the Dedans. I'll put these things in inverted commas. Think about the grill. Think about the penthouse, not the magazine, thankfully. Um, so we have these concepts, these specialized nature, specifically built courts, so specific, so technical, so advanced that you find them literally in royal houses. Hampton Court is often the, the example which is cited, but others as well. So we have this highly complex game. Now, the other thing we want to talk about is the notion, and I always want to spell this word wrong, that here we have an occasional game so mob football was occasional we can say that it was played on religious holidays okay so let's take um let's let's take something like Ashbourne mob football it was played twice a year on Shrove Tuesday and Ash Wednesday um if we look at Kirk and Wall mob football it's played on let me get this right boxing day and new year's eve for example we get these religious holidays as a result of um the 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 working conditions and the and the tendency to be working for that lower class whereas our real tennis is what we would call frequent now some people argue that real tennis is seasonal so i'll let you use that term if you want to seasonal in the sense that it's an indoor sport okay um but it was a uh, it was it's it, but it's frequently played and it's frequently played because the people that played this had time to do so now i just want to touch on gender just want to touch on gender uh, mob football was men only representing kind of tr uh, notions of masculinity and force and strength and real tennis it is argued by proponents of real tennis that it was played by both by both men and women but things i've read about this suggest that it was really predominantly participated in by men and it was part of almost like a chivalric code uh, the importance of a, of a man at this time to be um to be to be gallant to be uh to be physically capable but also to be romantic to be academic to be intelligent it was part of the chivalric nature and it was seen as a manly pursuit even though it was skill based so that's kind of an interesting concept that in another context we'd explore much further so that gives us a bit of a picture i want to be clear here note that i have not talked about mob football and said something like uh, no distinction between uh, players and spectators i'm not get, i, I want to stick to the idea that we're discussing here social class we've touched on literacy we've touched on gender transport now that's an interesting one actually do let me put that one in these games here were isolated okay in the sense that uh, each set of mob football was unique whereas with our uh, real tennis this was international 
Okay, so it was played, especially in Europe, especially in France and Britain, it was played internationally, and there was a combined set of rules. So that represents the notion of transport availability um, for different groups of people. And of course, in terms of wealth, this real tennis would have been particularly exclusive and expensive, and this mob football would have been um, much more accessible for people with little. So let's look formally now at the characteristics of popular recreation. And let's be clear about the word popular. We mean of the populace, of the people. All right, so let's go through this. We've already looked at the violent and rowdy nature of this, and we know that this is because it represented the harsh lifestyle that people um, experienced in pre-industrial times. We know that popular recreation was simple and un written rules which for some reason won't come out of my mouth because of illiteracy rates being so high illiteracy meant that sports didn't need to be codified that there wasn't the connection and communication to achieve that anyway but simple unwritten rules passed down by word of mouth and uh, experience were much more functional because people weren't literate on the whole sports were localized because we had of course lack of lack of communications and transport. So sports remained localized or what we tend to call isolated and unique. Sports were natural, okay? We can represent this by the idea of low technology, okay? Low technology. So sports tended to take on the natural features of the surrounding environment. A, a, you know, a great example would be swimming would be done in rivers. I mean, it seems fairly base really when we talk about it that way, but it, 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 it's, an it's an obvious point. Wagering. Wagering simply means betting, and the idea of this was that people like the idea of going from rags to riches, or if they were wealthy people and they loved to gamble, they could show their status. It was rural. Why? Because we had an agrarian lifestyle in pre-industrial times. In other words, people lived in the countryside. Courtly and popular is represented by what we call the feudal system. In pre-industrial times, we had a two-class society the lower class and the upper class. And the sports represented that. They were either played by the courtly or they were played by a popular. And there were a handful of examples that were played by both. Okay, an example of that would be something like pedestrianism, more of which in a moment. Sports were occupational. Okay, they developed from somebody's job. Okay, again, pedestrianism is a really good example of that. Uh, rowing would be another. And finally, sports were occasional. And this represents for the lower class the lack of time. But don't forget our exception of real tennis and, and other uh, refined sports and some field sports as well that were far more frequent because people had the time in this courtly group. Okay, in this courtly group. Okay, nice. Let's have a look at some questions. Now, we've got a question here. It says, uh, question one, Tom plays tennis. That's pretty much our only link to Tom. Explain why. Well, we know already that if we explain explain why we're using words such as because, we're using things like this means, we're using things like therefore, comma, this is going to emphasize the fact that we're explaining why. There are other examples, but to give us give us a start. So explain why real tennis was tennis was an exclusive game in pre-industrial Britain. So why was it exclusive? Why was it, we could put it in these terms, why was it courtly only? rather than courtly and popular or just popular. So what was the reason for that? Now, I made a bit of a mess up when I was preparing this. So I've had to like stick a whole layer over the top of this because I kind of messed it up a little bit and then put it in. So things changed that a little bit, didn't you? So let's have a look. Why was it exclusive? This is because, this is because it relied on specialized, dedicated space. And I've got specialized, dedicated space. Okay and specialized dedicated equipment. Maybe I ought to get a second mark for that one. Let's be generous. Okay, so we could give examples there of uh, of rackets, balls, nets. We could obviously talk about the court there. And this is only available to the upper class. Furthermore, the game had complex written rules. Therefore, comma, it was inaccessible to the illiterate working class. Okay, would we get another mark for that or is that connecting those up? The game required lots of free time to build skill, okay, we've got skill based. This means it was not possible for the working class. Finally, the game was expensive. And there's, I think that was a six marker, wasn't it? Oh, it was it eight? What am I doing? 
I got my max already. Apologies, folks. I th in my mind, I thought I had a six marker there, but it's four marks. So I, the last two I don't, didn't really need, but I've got more than enough here. This means the working class could not afford it. So I'm clearly explaining why. I'm clearly using my explanatory language, and I'm clearly including key um, answers within that context. Okay, so a nice answer explaining why. So we're saying specialised and dedicated space and equipment. We're saying complex written rules. We're saying uh, that meant illiterate lower classes couldn't participate lots of free time needed to build skill and it was expensive okay so some nice answers within that but clearly i am explaining why now if you feel you're rushed in terms of noting my answer down on your page don't worry about it first of all return to this later and you can get a more um detailed answer down but the but the other thing is have a go at answering this yourself okay have a go at answering this yourself you don't necessarily just need to use my answer have a go at answering this yourself Okay, question. Mob football reflected the class structure, educational levels, time and transport availability of pre-industrial Britain. Evaluate this statement. So basically, if we're evaluating a statement, we're arguing, is it true or untrue? Okay, that's our, that's our main argument here. And we should at least at times look at both sides of that argument because we're evaluating it. So we must look, did mob football reflect class structure, educational levels, time and transport availability of pre-industrial Britain? We've got to evaluate that. So let's have a little start on that. Mob football partly represented the two-class feudal system by being working class only. However, the upper class had no involvement. Okay, so we're getting a mark there for putting the other side. So we're saying, yes, it represented the feudal system because the lower classes played it. But no, it didn't represent the whole feudal system because it was only played by one of those classes. So I'm evaluating the statement. I'm saying how to what extent is it true. Next statement. Oof, big loads of it. Mob football represented the illiteracy of the working class by having no uniform written rules. Okay, and I'm saying on the other side here, as literacy rates improved in the 19th century, the game was codified. So I'm kind of looking at the other side of the argument there. There was very little transportation available. So mob football variations remained isolated. So there's my mark. And they were unique. The working classes worked to the agricultural church calendar. So mob football was played on religious holidays. Nice. I get my mark there. I think I've got one more little area here. Here's, when we're evaluating something, we really, 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 really should conclude our point. In conclusion, comma, the statement is true in relation to the working class, but untrue for the working class. So we've got a completely legitimate point there. So it did represent the lower class, but did not represent the upper class. So therefore, it is a partial representation of those groups. Now, we could go into more detail on each of those points. We could say the upper class did have transport available. The upper class did have free time. The upper class did, for example, have a high levels of literacy by attending those traditional, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, elite schools such as um, Harrow and Eton and Shrewsbury and uh, Charterhouse and so on and so on. So we could take that point a little bit further, but we have a nice answer in there. Again, notice the structure I've gone through. I'm arguing to what degree this statement is true, and I'm trying to give both sides of the argument. Okay, so the 1800s or the 19th century, you might call it. If you're one of the OC, if you're on the OCR exam board, just realise here we're talking about what you guys study as post 1850 developments. Okay, so again, we're going to be looking at your gender, your income, your uh, literacy rates, your transport, and these different factors in relation to what I want to start referring to you now as rational recreation now many times students have said to me james what is what does that mean rational recreation I don't understand the term so when we talk about the concept of rational recreation we kind of want to clarify that point first of all for me and the way i like thinking about rational recreation is it's sport with a purpose okay so it's sport with a purpose you might think well what purpose it's sport in the image of god now this is obviously it from the perspective of an educated middle class person in, in the mid to late 19th century. And finally, it's sport based on notions of fair play and sportsmanship. Okay. So from that comes out things like intrinsic value. Okay. Playing for enjoyment, not winning. 
being competitive for, uh, for, for health and for personal development, not necessarily to win. Concepts which today potentially, to some at least, feel quite alien to the way that we've got um, sports structured in the modern era. Sport in the modern era is almost entirely focused or high level sport I should say is almost entirely focused on the idea of competition and the greatest value is on winning reflect on that for a, at some point in your life why is that is that right is that correct does it have to be that way now if you start asking those questions really legitimately and, and thinking about potential alternative answers you can come up with some kind of intriguing stuff but anyway more, enough of me rambling on down some blind alley let's look at the characteristics of rational recreation first of all and we're really going to do this very quickly because where i want to jump to is is to this image over here as quickly as possible so as we've said already rational recreation was respectable okay it was respectable in the sense that it was non-violent it was respectable in the sense that uh it was accepted by the church uh, amongst other things it's codified make sure you realize that codified means it had accepted rules or what we call agreed rules, standardized rules. That's what we mean by that. It had regional, national, and international fixtures. We even had inter intercontinental fixtures in things like Ashes cricket by the by the 1880s. Okay, so this was much closer to what we understand today as modern sport. Had purpose-built facilities. Think about that in relationship to the Industrial Revolution. Okay, the Industrial Revolution. Okay, and what we mean by that is. Um, the Industrial Revolution produced many things, wealth, time for some, very little time for others, um, but it also produced technology, it also produced hardware, so therefore that Industrial Revolution allowed for purpose-built facilities to be developed. Fair play, we've talked about it already, we've got middle class values here, in here, control of gambling, the old way of wagering was prevented and a new middle class structure was established. We have sports becoming urban and suburban, why? because people migrated to the urban environment. It was elitist, we can often use the term exclusive. Okay, we just looked at the idea of exclusivity in our popular recreation, real tennis. It was only for some. Some sports even banned people that worked with their hands, lower class people, working class people. Classic examples were things like athletics and swimming. And we also have the regularity of sport, and this of course represents the time that people had available in one particular group in society in that group being the middle class so what are the reasons for this well look we've got our respectability point where does that come from it comes from middle class values middle class the middle class became wealthy through the process of the industrial revolution they effectively emerged blossomed bloomed exploded in number as a result of the industrial revolution there was a middle class back in the feudal system days but they were so insignificant in number they were considered to be not even worthy of naming them okay so there were so few there were so few bankers there were so few professionals there were so few legal people they it tended to be at the top of society and the bottom of society until this point the codified point is a really fascinating one. So codification, at least part of the reason for that, was that this middle class had well-established business skills and they used that business skills to form national governing bodies and to codify sports. Let's look at our regional, national, international competition. How can that be? Well, because we have the development of transport, we have the development of trains, we have the development of steam in terms of steam um, ships that could cross, cross oceans, even traverse half of the planet from Australia or from England to Australia. So we have the development of this. And now it seems like an odd one for me to include, but we also have canals. And you might be thinking, come on, James, not everyone, no one was traveling to a football away match on a canal boat. No, that is true. But the technology to build the facilities was traveling by canals. And that's why canals are important, really important, actually. And we tend to overlook it. So the development of canals allowed for the movement of hardware from one location to the other, often from ports inland. Technology, we've already touched on this, T technology enabled purpose-built facilities such as football stadia to be developed and to be built. The middle class, which emerged through this industrial revolution, they believed in a model of sport based on fair play. You will find this an odd concept when I explain it to you. But some team, let's take some football teams, for example. There's a very famous example called the Corinthian Casuals. Well, they're now called, to be fair, that's that's their modern name, the Corinthian Casuals. They were called the Corinthians only to begin with. But the Corinthian Casuals, or the Corinthians, when they played in their association football, 
in the late 19th century, if a foul was awarded to them, such as uh, uh, you know a, a player was kicked or as they would have called it hacked, which originally in football was allowed and was later banned, um, they would refuse to take that free kick, that penalty, that thing. Why? Not because they hadn't been fouled, but they they did not accept that a true sportsman was capable of foul play. Just reflect on that for a second. They were so adamant about the nature of what it meant to be a sportsman is that they refused to believe that a sportsman would be capable of foul play. It's a, it's a phenomenal concept, and I, I, I encourage you to explore it in your mind. Now, control of gambling, how? Well, there was the development of the police force. If you want to have a look at the history of the Metropolitan Police, very much surrounded in this particular uh, period of time, for example. I'm sure many of you have studied Robert Peel and those things. I'm not going to go down that road, but we have that concept as well. So we've got this simultaneous development. We've also got the notion of migration. Migration happened from the rural or the countryside to the urban so of course sports likewise move from the rural to the urban we've got the notion of elitism we had segregation in society you know segregated by districts by suburbs by job by dialect by all kinds of things and this was also elitism by segregation within sport and i urge you to um, investigate things like the exclusion clauses which i'm struggling to write the exclusion clauses that were introduced in sports uh, like athletics we also have free time okay so the regularity or the increased regularity of sport became possible because of the free time available for the middle classes so of course this is a really interesting concept um that one group in society had wealth riches and time and the other poor buggers the lower classes the working classes were in tremendously awful conditions producing that wealth now that is looking at the picture purely internally to sort of like the British society. If we look at who was being manipulated and used over a, over a wider distance, we again, we come to some fairly awful conclusions, but I'm not going to get into that here. I think you guys probably know what I'm talking about. Now, we do want to think about the process of industrialization. Now, James, are you going to tell us a whole history of the Industrial Revolution? Definitely not. I've got about four minutes here, and that would take a little bit longer. But what we are going to talk about is two basic trends. So the main thing I want to get across to you guys is if we look between 1800 and 1900, and imagine this is some kind of chronological development, what we find is from 1800 to 1850, we get a decline in participation. So this is what we call, this line here represents participation. Okay, participation. And what we get in the second half of the 19th century is we get an increase in, an increase in what we call involvement. Involvement in sport, involvement of sport. Okay, so something is happening in the second half, that's a five there by the way, Something's happening in the second half of the 19th century that suggests that involvement in sport and participation is dramatically increasing. So therefore, <coughs> we might at first glance want to say, well, this rational recreation thing, which was really at its peak by 1850 was very, very effective. Now, what I want to do is I want to talk about the positive impacts of industrialization. Now, just accept from me that on this negative side, we have things like poor health and sanitation. We have low wages. We have urban conditions that caused all kinds of problems for people participating in physical activity that they could have done before in their rural settings. We have notions of machine time we have a lack of holidays in this period. People only had four days off work a year, for example. So there were all these reasons that caused this decline in participation through the first half of the 19th century. But what I want to look at is, well, why did things increase and improve in the second half of the 19th century? So first of all, I want to represent the idea that time available went up. Okay, so there's a couple of points that we'd make here. People had more time. So we know that the middle class were wealthy and they emulated the upper classes in many ways because they had availability of time. But we've also got time increasing for the lower classes, for the workers. And for the workers, we really want to have a look at the notion of the factory acts. And these were passed between 1870 and the turn of the 20th century. And these factory acts introduced various things. So they meant that 
people worked half day Saturday, for example. Saturday, half day. There was also early closing on Wednesdays in many places. We also get the establishment of a maximum 12 hour day. Okay, so it might seem like an excessively long day to us these days, but it illegalized working people for longer. So we've got people in the latter half of the 19th century having gradually more time available. Now, the only point I'd make on that is that varies to whether the worker was skilled or unskilled. It was much, much, much earlier for skilled um, workers than unskilled workers. Now, so we've got more time. We've also got increasing health by the second half of the 19th century. Now, please do not think that we had some kind of utopian healthy society for working classes by 1870 or something. That's not the case. Um, cholera, dysentery were killing many, many people, but the situation was improving. Well, why was it improving? Well, we have the development of sanitation. Okay, It was a really important aspect. Think about a sort of a busy urban London having a sanitation system when it didn't before. Imagine what impact that would have. Secondly, with increasing health, we have the development of what we call public baths. And public baths are probably not what you think of them today, where you go to a swimming pool and you do a few lengths and maybe you jump about with a, when <laughs> you jump about on some inflatables. Public baths, they did include swimming in the 19th century, but they were literally wash houses. And this developed by what we call the Baths and Wash Houses Act. Baths, I never, never remember how to spell this, Wash Houses Act. And this meant, this made it um, much more affordable for local towns to be able to build public baths within their districts. And of course, that allowed people to have, they even went there to clean clothes, so they cleaned themselves, they cleaned clothes, they took exercise. This improved the overall general health of people uh, in society. So time went up, health went up. We even have the increase in wages, still you know, still not a fair system, but we have the increase in wages by the second half of the 19th century. And we also get the development of um, uh, cheap spectatorship. So think about um, urban sports like association football, for example. They allowed people to then be able to afford to be spectators. I mean, regardless of playing for a moment, they were able to afford taking part in the watching of these sports, which, of course, initiated and supported the growth of association football clubs, soccer clubs, at the heart of urban societies. Now, I'm not differentiating that from rugby. It would have done exactly the same thing. But football was the one that truly took off, I suppose. Now, we've also got here, if I put more time to point two here we have the increase in public holidays okay so we had more public holidays so as a result of this people have better wages more public holidays i'm going to talk about transport in a second you even had people taking part in what we call excursion trips visits to the seaside even perhaps really primitive forms of water sports taking part taking place but certainly sea-based river-based swimming would have been a classic example so we have increased time again now we have increasing transport so by the latter part of the 19th century we have a really well developed railway network and that increasing transport led to things like fixtures now the way trains worked at this time, or the, or the bigger trains, they would have, obviously um, they would have been steam powered, so fos um, you know coal burning, uh, uh, producing steam, but they would have allowed things like um, uh, first, second, and third class seats. Third class seats would have been super cheap, or well, I mean they would still have been. You'd still have to make a decision if you had these still increasing, still relatively low wages, but you could at least have a go at affording them. So this led to transport. Uh, sorry, to fixtures. The transport as well led to the excursion trips as well. We want to talk about down there. The other point is, or well, one of our final points, is we have the development of what we call industrial patronage or patronage, I've heard some people say. And this is the idea of factory teams. We also have church acceptance. So by the church recognizing the new rational form of sport as being valuable and developmental 
This meant that um, we had the develop, you know, pe people on a moral, ethical level were accepted for taking part in these, the church acceptance. And of course, this even led to things like church teams. Now, on factory teams and church teams, I mean, you use whatever examples you, that, that you like, but factory teams, you know, you could talk about um, clubs like Arsenal, West Ham for football. You could talk about Aston Villa in football as well. So this church acceptance led to the development of, of church teams. So finally, on Industrial Revolution, we already know we get the growth in the middle class. Now, we're kind of just repeating a point here, but these middle classes needed to be educated, okay? And they were sent to what we call Philistine public schools, copies of the elite schools, fee-paying, boarding, all that stuff. And of course, what they developed in these schools was a love of what we now call today athleticism. Athleticism is the com is the combination of moral discipline and integrity with physical pro uh, physical endeavor, uh, health, fitness, and so on. So that meant that these people coming back in society then spread their games further. More of which in some other uh, tutorials we have. If you go and have a look at the Everland.com, it will it will get you a, an awful long way. So coming back to our original point, what are we saying here? Involvement increased in the second half of the 19th century and here are many of the reasons why oh how could i space space so space which was an absolute premium in the early urban setting and we have the development such as uh, public parks and open green spaces within cities. This was something that was um, uh, uh, something that was promoted a great deal at the time by Queen Victoria. The need for uh, green spaces within cities, and she was a proponent, a supporter of that. And that space was developed in public parks. And of course, if you go to say London today, it's around. It, it, it's full of green spaces all over the very urban place. But there's many, many green spaces there. And part of that was because we get the development of public public parks within. This 19th century period. Now, I have to quickly change my canvas because I've got my question on the next page. Just bear with me for two moments. Okay, final little bit for today. We have an explain how question. Now, for me, when I see an explain how, I straight away think about the language. Oh, what's happened to my pen here? Through and by. Okay, hmm. I've got a really much thicker brush stroke on this canvas for some reason. I'm not sure why that's happened. Anyway, get back to my point. Explain how this is, you know, you're, you're describing or you're explaining some kind of process here. So you're going to say it happens through, it happens by. You could use via would be another kind of really good example um, of using an explain how type structure or language. It's kind of really emblematic of that kind of answer. But anyway, explain how rational rhetoric... Rec Blah, blah, blah. Rational recreation represented the society in which it existed, in which it existed in between 1850 and 1900. So, how was it that rational recre recreation? Oh my goodness, rational recreation represented its society. So, let's have a little go at, at doing that. Look, and straight away, I've got through, through its middle class values. Okay, middle class values. Of respectability. Now, I'm not sure if respectability is going to get me another mark, but I'm going to be generous to myself. I'm going to give myself both of those. Through the new transport networks, such as rail, it was rational, uh, sorry, it was national and even international. Next part of our answer. Uh, one second. Through the middle class model of law and order. The games involved rules, fair play, and control of gambling. We'll come back to these points in a second. Through the new urbanised society, the sports were played in urban city hubs. And already we have our max. So all I'm doing there is I'm taking my characteristics of rational recreation. I'm just giving them a societal, a societal basis. Why was it that they were played in cities? Well, because of the process of urbanisation, look. Why was it? Um, why was it that the sports were codified? Well, it was because of the new business skills of the middle class. Okay, I would have got my max by then, but you take my point. Why, um, why did the sport become national, international? Because of the transport networks. Okay, so we've got more than enough there to get ourselves over the line. So I'm explaining how through, by, via. Okay, so really important. Take your time with that when you come back to this recording. Have a look at that in a little bit of detail. Now, this question is for AQA only. Compare popular... Let, actually, let me clarify that. 
if if on your course you study both popular recreation and rational recreation, if you study uh, pre-industrial and post-industrial sport, there's no reason why this question couldn't be asked. The point we, I think what we want to clarify here, AQA only, what we mean by that is that this comparison is specifically referenced on the AQA spe specification. So it's perfectly possible it's asked elsewhere, but it's specifically relevant to, to you guys on AQA. All right, let's have a look. So we're comparing popular recreation to rational recreation with specific reference to track and field athletics. Okay, so pre-industrial athletics involves smock races and strength events. Okay, we didn't touch on this here, but those guys, you, you guys do in AQA, you do. Whereas post-industrial had the codified extra college structure. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Well, first of all, I'm comparing. There's my comma space, whereas is a comparative statement. Pre-industrial athletics involves smock races and strength events. And post-industrial, we have the extra college rules. Okay. There's probably two, uh, probably two marks for that. Uh, let's look at our next statement. Pre-industrial forms mostly involve the working class. However, comma, so I'm comparing, post-industrial was, mo I can't speak today, post-industrial was mostly middle class. Okay, I get my point there. Pre, pre oh my goodness, pre-industrial athletics was featured in rural festivals. Similarly, comma, still comparing and finding similarities, post-industrial was an urban festival exemplified by the modern Olympics. Okay, uh, nice. So I get my max in that. I'm clearly performing the skill of comparison. When we compare things, folks, we say things like comma space, whereas. We say things like, however, no capital, however, comma, similarly, similarly comma this is comparative language okay so we're, we're clearly saying this one thing is like this this other thing is like this this one thing was like this however this other thing is like this this thing was like this similarly comma this thing was also like this so we're clearly comparing and you guys should be in this in the habit of writing your answers in that format in my opinion so we're clearly comparing um pre-industrial uh, popular creation athletics to post-industrial we're clearly showing the skill of com that the skill of comparison what's happening here we're clearly showing that we're comparing things and we pick up our uh, marks as a result so the image i'd like to give really of that is that if you know your knowledge well the chances of you being able to nail the question increases significantly if you know what these words mean compare if you know what explain how means your knowledge your, your possibility of answering this exact question dramatically increases as a result of an intuitive and good grasp of those concepts and i can't urge that enough okay so here we are with the concept of olympism now obviously we're going to get to sort of olympic oaths we're going to get to notions of the modern olympics but what i want to do first of all i suppose is i want to address the background we want to address what was the background of the modern Olympics. Now, for some of you out there, um, background to modern Olympics. Well, I don't know why I'm writing this out because it's it's right under, <laughs> underneath. Look, I could have just gone this stuff here. Uh, the background to the modern Olympics. Now, for some of you, you specifically need to understand this in the context of the development and rationalization of, of athletics. You guys who look at track and field athletics, you know what I'm talking about with that. For the rest of us, we, we need to more generally understand the context and the development of the Olympic Games into its modern format. So I'm going to focus on that and you guys who are interested in the athletic track and field athletic side of this you can of course extract this information from there so first thing for me is we want to have a look at this timeline and it's kind of a pretty thing i'm kind of proud of it because we made it i personally think it's quite nice um but what i do want to say at this point is we need to address this kind of 1000 years here okay this 1000 years here so it's approximately 1000 years a little bit more um sorry a little bit less and what we have here is we have a period of time where the ancient olympics takes place and it ultimately ends okay and it ends here predominantly because of the growth of christianity okay so the christian influence that was kind of what's the right term I, I, you gotta be careful how you word these things i want to say it was sweeping across europe at the time I don't know if that's accurate or not, but this Christian influence kind of ultimately led to uh, the death of the this Olympic Games as 
as an as a, as an event which wasn't seen within a Christian ethic or ethos. So therefore, the games kind of uh, came to an end. But what it's worth knowing is, and was a huge spectator event. I mean, it was gigantic, and it was gigantic at a time where transport, communication, and travel was extremely limited from place to place. But it attracted uh, audiences from many, many, many a mile away. So this in many ways becomes therefore the forerunner to what we want to understand as the modern Olympic festival. Okay, Now, we're going to fast forward through a gigantic period of history, and obviously quite a bit happened in this period in uh, in the world, I mean obviously, but we're going to fast forward here to 1612, and we're going to fast forward here, not only going to fast forward to 1612, but we're going to fast forward specifically to a location and we're going to fast fast forward to Gloucestershire of all the places I've lived there a little bit in my life lovely county I recommend a visit but we're interested in Gloucestershire because in 1612 a gentleman called Robert Dover let's give him his full name Robert Dover he developed what we call the Cotswold Games now you already know that we call it the how does he spell it with a y the Olympics uh, CK in there. Just check that he had a Y in there. I'm just actually reflecting on that myself. Um, but it was CK on the end. The, the Gloucestershire Cotswold Olympic Games. So Robert Dover established this game and it's what we'd call a multi-event festival. And it has numerous uh, features to the games which are kind of unique and isolated and seem very special. One of the ones that sort of t- gets talked about a lot is the model of shin kicking. Okay, and it was a form of combat sport. I mean, you can like it to Muay, uh, Muay Thai or MMA today if you like, but it wasn't quite like that. Um, and it was a form of sort of combat sport which became popularized through this event. So in, in this event, there were athletic events, throwing events, there were combat events. And of course, that is very consistent, albeit stylistically very different, to the notion of the, of the ancient Olympic Games, a multidisciplinary sporting event. And Robert Dover effectively established that 1612 and it continues today so if you really want to you can go and have a little look at that now a further gentleman who's important to talk about became significant in 1850 notice we're doing a big jump again here so forgive us for that but in 1850 we have the development of what we call the much wenlock games a couple of things about this first of all it's a place in shropshire you can go and visit much wenlock if you like uh in, in shropshire and you may notice the names there uh, Wenlock, for example, was one of the, how do you call it, one of the mascots for the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games, so you can see where that name uh, came from. But Much Wenlock, again, was a multi-event um, sports festival, and it was established by a gentleman, I'm going to write his name up here, his name was William William Pennybrooks. So by this time, we are into the realms of having a typical, and now in two different locations, multi-sport event in England. Now, a couple of things about William Penny Brooks. I'm actually going to put this down here. Let, let me let me just write down here. Let's call him Dr. Brooks because that's a nice way to refer to William Penny Brooks. Dr. Brooks. A couple of things about him that I think you should be in, you should uh, be aware of. This guy who uh, established the Much Wenlock Games. First of all, he considered himself what we call a reformer. And he was particularly interested in the power of sport in the reformative process. He was dedicated to a model of education so again for us and if there's teachers in classrooms as we do this for example this becomes a very significant figure because this guy in many ways was one of the first proponents and advocates of a, of a system of physical education or the value of physical education for a broad range of people so that becomes a very interesting notion so let me uh, let me establish there that physical education was a key principle by which he, va- or key principle he valued and wanted to establish within his games, and the other thing he did was he tried. He tried to influence the public schools. So what we've got here is we've got a guy who considers himself or sees himself as a reformer. He's interested in education through movement and he's trying to influence the the, the most uh, influencing group within sort of the sporting context, which was the public schools of the 19th century, where this concept of athleticism was kind of developing and growing. And as a result of that, this guy becomes particularly important and important for another reason. But let's just focus for a second on the fact that he established this much Wenlock Games. Now, we jump forward 40 years, look. 
and we're now interested in a meeting. We have the same gentleman, Dr. Brooks, who has a meeting with a French baron, Baron Pierre Freddy de Corbetin, quite a name, quite a mouthful. From that name, you can tell this gentleman was born into some notion of wealth and riches, an aristocrat within France. And this de Corbetin visited and toured, he toured uh, England, and specifically, he toured places like much when lock for the games he also toured these public schools that i've referred to down here and he started to build up an idea of what we would describe as modern modern athleticism now those of you that study a little bit about the public schools in the 19th century which i'm not going to talk about in much detail today you will already know that this that this gentleman uh, that this gentleman had a very strong um yeah, this this gentleman had a, a a very interesting experience in touring these now predominant and uh, preeminent public schools, which were really the 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 melting pot and the basis of a development of codified modern sport as we see it today. So of course, this guy de Corbetin was kind of I, I'm probably doing him a disservice, but he was nicking these ideas right, and as a result of that. De Corbatin in 1896 managed to re-establish a version of the Olympic Games which we refer to now as the modern Olympic Games. Now a couple of things that I would really stress about this modern Olympic movement before we get to the Olympic Oath. A couple of things I would really stress. It was based on a principle of athleticism. This is both moral and physical. Secondly, we can describe, if you like, um, we can describe de Corbatin as a bit of a visionary. And we consider him to be a bit of a visionary because he, he sort of, through this Olympic movement, he emphasised kind of three main principles. See if I can just squeeze them in here. He emphasised unity, more of which in a second. He emphasised the notion of international relations, so that this had to be an international event. Okay, so international, I mean, let me put it up here. He also emphasised the note or the value of competition. He valued, or he emphasised the value of competition. So we can see where this, this sort of notion of modern Olympic spirit came from. And I would sort of simply say to you about the Olympic Games in Athens, a couple, a couple of things you should be aware of. Right, it was amateur entirely. So it was an amateur event. In fact, professionals were completely banned. It involved what we would call today Western Europe. Okay, so Western Europe. It involved the USA. It involved Australia. And it involved Chile. Okay, so these were the countries basically that competed. Interesting facts about the modern Olympics. We call, you mentioned the word unity here, women were banned from the Panathinaiko Stadium in Greece, in Athens, from even watching this game. So how unified was it? Well, it was unified between certain countries and certain genders, and there was probably not a lot of diversity within those groups. Okay, so there's, you know, I think in, in modern terms that this is, you know, we, we would question that concept of unity, I guess. Um, and finally, of course, we have then a whole century of Olympic Games, which although we've had Rio since culminated in the third London Olympic Games in 2012, which some of you may well have attended. So moving on from that, that sort of background, I want to have a look at this Olympic Oath and explore it a little bit. It says here, in the name of all competitors, okay, in the name of all competitors, competitors, I promise that we shall take part in these Olympic Games, respecting and abiding by the rules which govern them, committing ourselves to a sport without doping and without drugs, in the true spirit of sportsmanship, for the glory of sport and the honour of our team. So a couple of things that I would draw out of that first of all. These points here, let me make, that was meant to be an arrow. This is what we'd call intrinsic value. Okay, and what we mean by that is that to, to participate and to compete in at its nature is a fulfilling and developmental experience. Notice this wording here, we want to take part. It doesn't say we are going to compete to win. It doesn't it doesn't say we are going to scientifically approach the concept of winning a medal. It says we're going to take part. It's based on a principle of respecting and abiding the rules. So it has to be rule-based. So the Olympic oath emphasizes deeply the notion of rule adherence. Let me write that in for you. Rule adherence. So therefore, when we have this as the fundamental principle by which the Olympic Games are um, manifest, we have to ask fairly serious questions of why things like um, the Russian doping scandal 
went on for almost four years before Russia was banned and they competed in two Olympic Games, summer and winter. So we have to ask that and it comes back to the idea of doping with and without drugs. We know today that <clears throat> there is there are many, many examples of individual uh, drug use and deviancy in that way, but we also know that there are systemic approaches to drug use. Now, Russia most recently is the biggest example, but there have been other kind of partial approaches. Now, before I make this statement, let me be clear that the group I'm about to talk about have not been proven to have cheated in any way, shape or form. Okay, so let me prefix it with that. But can we also look at something like the Team Sky approach, which ultimately feeds into the Olympics, and what we might call the kind of the professionalism the professionalism of that approach and raise questions about this notion of taking part, respecting the rules and doing so with glory and honour those intrinsic values. Could we make an argument that that concept has been diluted today because of this push towards professionalism, win at all costs or the win ethic and, and, and winning as being the commodity of value? So I'm obviously taking a very sceptical approach to this oath, but this is the Olympic oath that all athletes swear to. Now, the Olympics is also traditionally seen as an amateur event. So let us just clarify what we mean by amateur. You guys know already that we describe it as non-paid. Okay. Now, we also know that golfers, tennis players, uh, basketballers, professional athletes take part in the Olympic Games. Now, they may not be paid a performance fee by the IOC, for example, but they are being paid in other ways, endorsements, um, increase in exposure, this sort of thing. Amateurism is also what we call a traditional approach, okay, a traditional approach. And it emphasizes the value of taking part over winning. It's what we describe as a non-scientific, non-scientific approach. Amateurism is not a model which is closely linked to sports science, biomechanics, physiology, sports medicine. It's linked to a notion of kind of one's natural talents one's natural talents coming to preeminence and allowing one uh, to be successful. Amateurism we tend to find is, or we tend to describe it as for intrinsic values, intrinsic values. So amateurism is all of these sorts of things. So if amateurism is closely associated with the Olympic Games, it's a particularly fair question to ask, to what degree is amateurism still representative of the, or, or does the, this Olympic Games still represent amateurism today and of course we see some examples many examples where the concept of amateurism to a great degree has been lost that's not to say it's been entirely lost but to a significant degree it has been lost so it's much more than not being paid it's also this traditional non-scientific natural talent intrinsic value in the very traditional sense we would say the glory of god Okay, so people would perform in this kind of image of God. I mean, we always quote this sort of great example of the film, The Chariots of Fire. It might be worth you having a look at it at some point. Sort of this godly idea that, you, that, that your movement and your participation is representing some kind of God-given talent or ability. And that's what we mean by amateurism. Now, I've gone way too long on this already. So let's have a look at a question. I don't want to sort of show the bit of my answer so far. This question here asks me, discuss the extent, well suggests to me discuss the extent to which the modern olympic games can still be considered an amateur event so we're given the command to discuss and as we've said in many occasions before discuss could mean numerous things it often means you have to describe something it often means you have to explain something it often means you have to compare something it often means let's compare it often means you have to evaluate something Okay, so when we look at this question, we have to sort of decipher what is behind that discuss command. Now, for me, I, I look at the command discuss the extent, and then it's going to give you a statement. To me, what you're doing there is you're evaluating a statement. To what degree is it true? Now, close to that is a notion of justifying you know, you have to kind of justify that that statement is true if you're asked to do that. But in this case, I think we're evaluating why, because we're going to have a look at to what degree is it amateur and to what degree isn't it amateur. So on that basis, it's very common we're going to see uh, statements such as, on the one hand, on the other hand. 
So you're looking, in other words, at both sides of this argument. On the one hand, it is amateur because. On the other hand, perhaps it's not so amateur because. You know, we're, we're looking at those kinds of... Um, we're looking at those kind of structures. Um, we're going to be using lots of becauses. We're going to be using a, 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 an example of this. We're going to be using also uh, a strength. A strength of this argument is a weakness of this argument is. And so on. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take this statement. The modern Olympic Games can still be considered an amateur event. And we're going to decide to what degree is that true. So this is kind of a long answer question. Now, again, you guys are on OCR. Yes, you have to consider the synoptic nature of this. But I'm not including that within this particular session. In fact, we're not including that in our revision at all. Take your teacher's guidance on that stuff. So what have I got here? Let's have a look. So I'm trying to judge this. On the one hand, we mentioned this earlier, on the one hand, the Olympic Games welcomes amateur athletes from all parts of the world. So it welcomes amateur athletes. On the other hand, the Games have increasingly become associated with professionalised sports. Okay, so I've clearly looked at that from both sides of the possible argument, and I can link those up as a possible accreditation or possible credit for this, this question. So sports such as tennis and golf look, so I'm giving examples here. It could be argued that amateur ideals are still at the heart of the game, at the games. So amateur ideals still at the heart of the games. However, in many cases, athletes are focused entirely on winning and fair play has taken a secondary role. So I'm arguing both sides of this. So fair play, much less important. By the way, I definitely should have written um, fair play when I was doing this earlier. Apologies. It's based on a notion of fair play, or what you might call sportsmanship, rather than, for example, a win ethic or win it or cost ethic, which are not the same thing. We're also saying here, um, currently, athletes are not paid. So that clearly agrees with the amateur conditions. Uh, they're not paid money for competing. Nevertheless, these same Olympic athletes make other income through endorsement, TV appearances, and so on, okay? So we're making both sides of this argument. Yes, it's amateur, but on the other hand, it's not. It's kind of including of professional um, scientific approaches, but it still remain. It still holds on to an amateur center and so on. In support of this statement, many athletes retain an intrinsic value to competing. So that's in support of the amateur side. However, there have been countless co uh, cases of athletes displaying a winner all costs approach. Now. When I read my answer back there, or I would consider that to be like a quarter of an answer, the start of an answer, you know, we need to go further, we need a conclusion, all those things. The thing that I feel I haven't included enough of is examples. Okay, so I'd urge you to put some further examples in. I've mentioned tennis and golf here, but look, countless examples where people have displayed a win at all cost approach. Could I give an example of that? Could we look at, say, Wiggins and his TUE, is is uh, therapeutic use exemptions? Now, you've got to be careful what you say and how critical you are of people because we don't know exactly what happened, but it would be certainly interesting to raise it as part of the consideration within this answer. Okay, so let's have a look at these individual examples of Olymp Olympic Games. And guys, two things before we start. First of all, this session is not relevant to you AQA bods, okay? So if you're an AQA, you, you, you know, it's not going to do you any harm to study this. But, you know, let's be honest, it's not going to, it's not going to be a fundamental part of your exam experience. So just be aware of that. Secondly, um, I want to sort of prefix this entire session because we're going to look at some really sensitive things here we're going to know we're going to have a look at notions of, notions of racism notions of terrorism notions of murder and violence I'm just I'm just conscious that in in a very time pressured environment where I go through this really really fast, you know I might place a word not quite perfectly or something like that. Just understand that what I intend to do here is with the utmost sensitivity to anybody who's been affected by these incidents. And with respect, you guys know that, right? You, I think you already know that would be the case. But just so you know, sometimes we do these these, these things live. You know, you can you can sometimes phrase something in a way that doesn't sort of represent your views. So um, just be aware of that. Anyway. All that being said, let's see what happens. You, you guys might be more attentive now. I've said that. Um, so, 1968 seems a long time ago. It was before I was born, even um, or a very long time ago. And we have a, we're interested in this uh, games in 1968, and of course, it's the games in Mexico City. 
okay? Mexico City. And of course, we're going to get to um, Smith and Carlos in, in a moment. But the first thing I want you to be aware of with this game is it's the first, first in Latin America. So Latin America, what we mean by that is any Spanish or Portuguese uh, speaking part of the American continent. So that includes all of um, North American uh, Spanish speaking areas such as Mexico, but it also includes the vast majority of South America, including Brazil. Okay, So this was the first game. We've had another one in Rio subsequently, of course, but this is the first one. Why is that important? Well, it's important because of what we call political suppression. Now, we don't talk about this anywhere near enough, I don't think, but 10 days before the game started, there was actually a massacre just outside Mexico City for, of people who were opponents of the political system at the games. So just be aware of that. So there was a massacre just before. So there were huge protests as these games started. You can kind of imagine uh, what that would be like. Okay, so just be aware that is. It shouldn't be considered a side story to these games. This is pivotal stories of these Olympic Games, but it tends not to be the bit that we focus on uh, as much. The bit we do tend to focus on a lot is the winning of the 200-meter uh, Olympic title by a guy called Tommy Smith and the, goal, uh, the bronze medal performance by John Carlos. And you see these two gentlemen pictured in the image here. So this is Tommy Smith here and this is John Carlos here. Okay, so we've got, uh, let's call them gold and bronze, G and B. So they won gold and bronze in the 200 meters. Now, both of these athletes, both of these athletes ended up suspended. Well, why? And the reason that this happened is because while they were on the podium, they made what became known as a black power salute. If you notice, both of them are wearing a gloved, uh, or uh, are uh, displaying a gloved fist. If you also look really carefully, Smith is wearing a right glove and Carlos is wearing a left glove because it was actually a pair of gloves, which was given to them, it's believed, by this guy, Peter Norman. Okay, so it's believed that he actually passed the gloves on to them, but they gave what's called a black power salute. Now, without getting into deep details in this, you have to understand that this was in the era of the civil rights movement within uh, the United States and um, was took a place at, at a time where the legal status of non-white people was literally lesser than that of white people. So it's ironic that we call it a black power power salute in my opinion it, it in many ways although obviously they're representing the opposite idea you could describe this as a black powerless uh, salute what they're trying to say here is that there's an atrocity taking place in our home nation and we're trying to draw attention to it and they gave what had become a fairly customary uh, salute of the of the clenched black fist to display this okay so of course this wasn't taken well people get very offended as you probably realize by uh, by opposition to uh, things like racism and um, what's the words I'm looking for? Pe pe people, the issue was found with this was not that there was a deep racist society in the US, but that people sort of pointed to it. Okay, and you can make you can draw your own con conclusion to that. Now, I'm going to talk to you about Peter, Peter Norman. He's the guy here. He was from Australia. I think he's still alive, actually. He's from Australia, and um, he won the silver medal. Now, he did two things. He gave the gloves, as I've just mentioned, or it's believed that he did. He gave the gloves, and he wore a badge. Now, I, I don't think you can really see it on the image. Perhaps you can see it on your sheet better than, than I can. But he wore a badge in support of the two athletes as well. And it's stunning what happened to him. So he was completely ostracized um, by the Australian system after this. And not only did they ban him, but they banned every spr every sprint on the team in the 1972 so they refused to take any sprinters because of what this guy did and again at a time where it's arguably a very very just cause right um so a couple of key terms make sure you include in your answer the idea of a black gloved fist okay that's important and the other thing is that the athletes and it's often not talked about this bit they they wore black socks no shoes. Now, I'm not exactly sure why that was, but I'm assuming it's sort of a back to the earth type concept. Okay, so I'm not sure exactly why this was done, but they the, the, one of the representations of this sort of black power movement was the idea of wearing um, black socks and no shoes. So just just be um, just be aware of it. And it was considered. Please accept this is not my view. It was considered a disgrace, and it was considered a, a disgrace to the U.S. Okay, so their racial policies apparently weren't a disgrace, 
but the fact that someone putting them out was. So you can reflect on that yourself. So very interesting politicisation of those games. Now, 1972 is where we get to Munich. Feel free to call it München. For those of you uh, who know a little about German, you can do that. Um, and uh, Munich, of course, city in southern Germany and Bavaria, and they held the games in 1972, and they got they had a beautiful slogan for their games. It was called the the Heiteren the Heiteren Spieler, or what you and I might understand better as the cheerful games and the games had been entirely set up to be a contrary example to that which had been shown um, pre-war in 1936 by Hitler and Goebbels who presented this idea of racial supremacy so it was really important to the German state that they represented a complete different notion of what an Olympic Games could be it didn't quite work out that way why well an organization called what is believed to be called at least the Black September organization the back the black september organization they stormed the olympic village and it is believed well they were palestinian one of these guys i believe is still alive today the last time i read about this it may have changed since then what did they do well they undertook what we would refer to as a kidnapping kidnapping again i, I never know exactly what words to use for this particular set of circumstances but let's let's go for this but they they undertook a, a kidnapping and murder of 11 Israeli athletes and officials. So, <laughs> unbelievably serious stuff. I mean, this is so far from the concept of sport that it's possible to get, right? So, as a result of this, we had all kinds of um, uh, issues that led from this. So, first of all, it's really useful for us to know that this led to what we call the anti-terrorism movement to the anti-terrorism movement now this seems pretty common to us today but it was really this event that predicated the anti-terrorism movement and it's something we read about or hear about fairly commonly today but it came out of this particular um uh, event and a couple of things that i would like you to be aware of and reflect on this the games were stopped now i haven't finished my sentence yet the games were stopped what do you think i'm going to write next for 24 hours okay so the games were stopped for 24 hours. Reflect on that a second. So 11 people were captured and murdered and the games were stopped for 24 hours. What's your view on that? What do you think that represents? It's a very interesting thing to reflect on. Now, just a couple of details about the incident. So three of the terrorists uh, survived this event, as I said before, one still alive today. They managed to persuade the authorities to get them a helicopter to take them and their captives to the airport. There was then a botched arrest and there, were, there, was, uh, there was gunfire, there were grenades that were exploded. There's a machine gun involved, and the the attempt to the attempt to actually get these athletes and officials back went badly, badly wrong. And one of the things that's believed to have caused that is was was that the German um, uh, the German security forces were effectively unarmed. So since the events of the 30s and 40s, when of course the Second World War had happened, I'm not obviously we're not going to get into that stuff. But of course Germany wanted to present itself as a non-militarized place and as a result of that this this event perhaps got even worse anyway I, I want to be careful what i say about that because that you know there's many different ways to interpret that finally at least for this session and do be aware that some of you do look at other um other games i want to talk about the 1984 games that were held in la okay and this is actually the first games that i personally remember so a couple of things that are really useful to know about this first of all we get the boycott by the soviet union now remember that in well some of you might not know this but in 1980 the US led by the president Jimmy Carter at the time and 64 other countries boycotted the games in Moscow so there was a boycott by the Soviet Union plus 13 other nations so in total 14 nations um, actually uh, boycotted this games so we got 14 nations in, in total and we would call those the Eastern Bloc Okay, so in these old Soviet times, it's what we'd call the Eastern Bloc. There's no K on the end of Bloc for some reason. I never know why that is. So as a result of this, the, those that boycotted, they organised, they organised their own games, organised the, so the, these 14 countries, they organised what we'd call, the, what they refer to as the Friendship Games. So they had their own like little breakaway Olympics. Okay, so it's kind of a weird situation to reflect on it now. And eventually, 
in 1986, so two years after the Olympic Games, there was something held which was called the Goodwill Games, which eventually saw American and Russian athletes compete against one another uh, in that environment. Now, at that point, it, it would be fascinating if we had more time to look at things like deviancy around this period, to look at endemic drug use by both states. It would be fascinating to do that, but instead we're going to move on to something else. I want to talk to you about uh, about a gentleman we, whose name is Peter Uberoth. Uberoth. Peter Uberoth, okay? Now, this guy, Peter Uberoth, he was what we would call the organiser. So he was the organiser of the 1984 Games, and he did something incredible. He was the first, or this was the first privately funded Games. Now, all of the Games before this had been effectively funded by states. Okay, so this was the first privately funded Games. And what happened? They made a surplus of $250 million. $250 million surplus. So it was the first commercially successful Olympic Games that had ever been held. And it's really useful for you guys to, to, to reflect on that. And the Games were effectively organised by 150 entrepreneurs. So think, I guess, in today's world, it would be your Bezoses and Musks. These kind of guys would have been the organisers, these 150 entrepreneurs. And they basically, one of the, one of the key things that they did was that they recruited very aggressively sponsors that would sponsor this Games. And as a result, it became sort of a very commercialised image of what we would consider to be that traditional amateur sporting event that we talked about a little bit earlier on. So Peter Uberoth is a very important character because he, fe he effectively structured what we would refer to today as the modern Olympic movement with regard to its commercial structure. So we're interested in him for that reason. Now, I think if I remember right, that's right, I just have to do a very quick change of canvas and I'll come straight back to you with examples of um, answers on this topic. Okay, canvas changed and we are in the home straight. So let's have a look at this question. Making reference to a range of Summer Olympic events, so we must talk about a range of Summer Olympic events. We're not going to get anything for talking about Winter Olympics in this question. Explain how, okay, I'm going to come back to that. Explain how the modern Olympic Games have become a vehicle for political exploitation. So for me, first of all, explain how. In my mind, I immediately jumped at a certain kind of sentence structure, and it would be a nice one for you perhaps to potentially be able to jump to as well. I know that in this answer, I'm going to be sort of writing something happens by the following happens. Something happens through or through the process of something else. Okay, I know I'm going to be structuring it that way because that's how you explain how something happens. It happens by it happens by A, B, and C. It happens through the following. Okay, and via is another possibility that you can use if you want. So I already know that my sentence structure is going to incorporate those things. Now, I've got some mad question structure here because I've been asked for eight marks. Now, again, I would reflect I would ask all of you, check on your specification. Is it possible you'll get an eight mark question, which is one correct answer for one correct mark? For some of you out there, it is possible. And for others, it's much, much less likely, okay? So just reflect on that as well. But for here, we're gonna assume that is the case. If your maximum kind of what we call short answer questions, if your maximum is six marks, you can change this to a six mark if it works better for you, okay? so. On that basis, I want to start going through this process. How is it that different Olympics have become a vehicle for political exploitation? Now, I'm going to talk about some of the games we have referenced already, and I'm going to incorporate knowledge for some that we haven't. And I think I'm going to avoid completely 1968 in here because I'm going to talk about that when we get down to this question here. Okay, so I'm going to choose not to talk about 1968 because we're going to look at that in a second. So let's have a look. Hitler. We could write Hitler and Goebbels. We could write the Nazi party, write those sorts of things. Hitler politicised in the 19... That should be the, I think. The 1936 Games by... By... By promoting racial supremacy and downgrading the, the achievements of non-white athletes. What's going on with my writing here? They should say athletes in there. 
non-white athletes such as Jesse Owens. I obviously wrote that in a bit of a rush. Non-white athletes such as Jesse Owens. So we pick up two marks by talking about Hitler's politicization of the 1936 game through this promotion of kind of Aryan white supremacy and the downgrading or the refusal to acknowledge non-white athletes such as Jesse Owens. So by talking about this political behavior, we show how this, or by how this um, process taking place. Let's have a look at another example. In Munich in 1972, comma, Palestinian terrorists politicized by capturing, holding hostage, and murdering. That's meant to be read. Eleven Israeli athletes and officials. Okay, so could we get a mark for saying Palestinian terrorists? Could we get a mark for saying capturing, holding hostage, and murdering? Now, again, you might want to reflect on why Palestinian terrorists would have done this. I mean, um, for that, I would encourage you to. Um, get a big picture understanding of uh, the the, the uh, Palestinian and Israeli as the Jewish state um, situation in the Middle East. So, of course, it, in this particular issue, it, 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 it was not accidental that the Palestinians targeted the Israeli athletes, one would assume. Okay, so that's why that kind of political exp exploitation is taking place. Next point. In 1980, and we didn't look at Moscow just now, but as an example, Jimmy Carter and the US made political acts by boycotting along with 64 other nations. So we've got Jimmy Carter and the US and we've got the boycotts of those nations. Okay, so we've got this political um, act. And again, look here, we've got by. It's happening by the following. Next example. In 1984, the Soviet bloc politicized, so the Soviet bloc politicized the games through a 14-nation boycott of the Olympic Games, and then we end up with our max. Now, again, I repeat, we could have talked about um, we could have talked about the 1968 games. We could have talked about the 76 games in Montreal. For those of you that study, only some of you do incorporate the games which are relevant to you in your course. But the point I want to make there is that's how we get through and explain how question. We say it happens by and through. Have a look at that. Through by where where have I gone over here? By. Uh, by okay so I'm clearly going through that explaining how process and it's such a simple thing guys it's not even like a writing frame really I mean it's a thinking frame you, you would have the knowledge to go about these things but the question is could you just put them into a structure which is an explaining how structure and that's a very simple model in, in order to achieve that okay next question with reference to the Summer Olympic Games of 1968 specifically summarize the relationship between sport and politics so again in many ways it's the same question this time my skill is summarizing now summarizing is very similar to describing if you want to know the exact um, uh, description of summarizing it's give the main details okay give the main details you don't have to say why you don't have to say how even but you need to give the main details summarize the relationship between sport and politics so let's have a little look at that a second. So first few points. Oof. The 1968 games were characterized, so characterized by, were characterized by two political events. Firstly, after winning gold and bronze respectively, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, let's link those up and give us a mark, each raised a black gloved hand in what is described as a black power salute and were immediately uh, suspended by the US team. Now, perhaps at that point, we might even get a submax at that point. And what do we mean by a submax? It means that we might only have three of those five marks available for um, for talking about that kind of Smith, Carlos, Black Power aspect of this. How else was their relationship between politics and the games? Let's have a look at what we've got. Furthermore, Peter Norman, who finished second, wore a badge in support. So again, that could potentially get us another mark, but we're going to assume we've got our submax. Sub Secondly, this was the first games in Latin America and was surrounded by protest due to political suppression. And now we've got our max. So if we think about the descriptions that we made of that 1968 games, there were basically two main political features. One was the, um, the issue surrounding Carlos Smith and Norman, um, in the 200 meter podium and the other one was about the the, the political protests that, uh, by uh, Mexican people towards the organizing body now again 
You could, of course, go on to talk there about the massacre. And that massacre, as I said before, was 10 days before opening ceremony. I can't remember how many people were killed in that massacre, but it was a lot. And the idea was that they specifically killed political opponents of the political system that was in power. So, again, if you look at kind of, if you look at sort of um, uh, other historical examples of that, other precedents of that, you, you get to some dark places in human history. And we're saying that basically this happened as well just before the 1968 Games. And as a result, we can see the clear link between Olympics or sport at Olympic Games and politics.